You now seem to be saying that if the SNP simply wins a majority of Westminster seats, then that must be enough to trigger negotiations on independence, i.e. to be a mandate for independence. How can you possibly believe that? This may be a novel idea. I don't think it is. But if you win an election, I genuinely believe you should be able to then fulfil the manifesto that you've been elected on. They could resolve this issue tomorrow. They could hold a referendum. They could grant the permission of a referendum. And I'll tell you what, the reason why they're scared, or as we say in Scotland, why they're feared to hold a referendum is because I suspect they know that they would lose it. We have to end there. Hamza Yusuf, thank you very much for joining me on Hard Talk. Thank you, Stephen. That was Hard Talk. I'm Jeff Goods. Have a great day. Good morning, Manitoba, and hello, Winnipeg. I'm Marcy Marcusa. This is Information Radio, and we are live in downtown Winnipeg. Here to start your day with you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, great to have you along. It's going to be a 15-degree high today in Winnipeg with a mix of sun and cloud. And we're already above zero this morning, even though we're not even at 6 a.m. So welcome to uh, Tuesday, April 9th. Your morning show's on until 8.37 a.m. here on CBC. And, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. So who is here? Let's say good morning to the team. Abby Adiemi is back behind the controls. Good morning, Abby. Abby's our technical producer on the show, and we'll cover weather. Good morning, Brad Lillies, who's also on the team today. Good morning to uh, Corey Funk, who will direct the show and will be covering the commute. And good morning to Heather Wells, who's here to start our show officially with our headlines. Let's find out what's making news in Manitoba. Good morning. Good morning. Well, the wife of a Winnipeg man who has been in a Mexican hospital for more than a month is desperate to get him home. Jim Gibbons has been in a hospital in Mazatlan after a scratch turned into deadly sepsis. His wife, Stacy Conway, says initially their insurance company said he could come home when he was fit, but when doctors gave him the all clear, Conway says Sun Life told her the WRHA said there were no beds in Winnipeg. The WRHA tells CBC a lack of beds was not the barrier in this case. We'll hear more. And Manitoba's Advanced Education and Training Minister says Ottawa's international student cap for post-secondary institutions has hurt this province. I'll be back with more Manitoba news at 6.30. All right, thanks, Heather. You're welcome. Well, what incredible images we got out of the eclipse yesterday all across the country. We're going to start by hearing from some very excited students who experienced it here in Manitoba. We did not have the best view, but we still got a view. So stay tuned. We'll uh, share that, and also we'll share some memories that came in uh, all over social media throughout the entire day, so stay tuned. Also, this morning on the program, we're going to talk about a new CBC Gem comedy drama that's tackling depression in the South Asian community. We're going to hear from its co-creator about it. We'll also touch base with Ryan Tumulty as our Ottawa report kicks off, so we're going to talk more about what we understand about the inquiry into foreign interference. Later, we've got a great local story. It's a feature you might have seen online, uh, but the producer behind it's going to be in. Reporter CBC's Darren Bernhardt is behind this. He recently dug through archival image from the 1870s to show how Winnipeg has changed. And we'll talk to him later. A on Q with Tom Power. Synesthesia is the crossing of senses, like seeing color when you hear sound or even tasting sound. Rudy Mancuso talks to Talia Schlanger about how he turned his own daily experience with synesthesia into his first feature film which sounds kind of cool and different and romantic, but it can also be quite torturous and distracting and unnerving. That's coming up on Q, followed by Commotion with Elamine Abdel-Mahmoud on CBC Radio 1, the CBC Listen app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Won a landmark climate case in Europe's top human rights court, Senior women for climate protection argued Switzerland's efforts to combat climate change were inadequate and they were at risk of dying during heat waves. Judge Schiefer O'Leary is the president of the European Court of Human Rights. She says the Swiss government's failure to meet past greenhouse gas reduction targets had violated some of their human rights. This included a failure to quantify through a carbon budget or otherwise national greenhouse gas emissions limitations. The case was brought by more than 2,000 women. It could have a ripple effect across Europe and beyond, setting a precedent for how some courts deal with climate litigation argued on the basis of human rights violation. The court this morning also threw out two other similar cases, one by a French mayor and the other by six Portuguese youth. 
March was another record hot month for the planet. New data released today by Europe's climate agency shows last month averaged 14.14 degrees Celsius. That pushes past the previous record from 2016 by a tenth of a degree. March is the 10th consecutive month of record-breaking temperatures. Climate scientists attribute most of the record heat to human-caused climate change from carbon dioxide and methane emissions. Germany is defending itself from allegations it is facilitating genocide in Gaza. Yesterday, Nicaragua asked the world court to order Germany to stop arming Israel and to reinstate funding for the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency. Lauren Comato is at The Hague, where Germany just made its counter-argument. Saying they want to set the record straight, Germany's lawyers use slides and documents to present a detailed account of the supplies Germany has given to Israel and the aid it's provided to Palestinians since the October 7th Hamas massacres. Christian Tam says Germany has strict licensing requirements for exporting war weapons to Israel. Each request is decided on a case-by-case basis. And to date, he says, 97 percent of the licenses the country has granted have been for defensive military equipment, including protective gear like masks, helmets and camouflage paint. As a matter of fact, only four war weapons have been licensed for export since October 2023, three of which concern test or practice equipment. The minute we look closely, Nicaragua's accusations fall apart. Germany presented numbers to show it's been the biggest international donor to Palestinians since October. It says the temporary decision to pause money to the Palestinian refugee agency, UNRWA, has not stopped a single euro of aid. Nicaragua wants the court to order Germany to stop sending military support to Israel. But with Israel, the country being accused of genocide, being absent from these proceedings, Germany argues that the court lacks jurisdiction to make any ruling at all. A decision will likely take weeks. Lauren Kamato for CBC News, The Hague. The public inquiry into foreign interference is narrowing in on what government officials knew about foreign meddling in the last two elections and what they intentionally kept quiet. Today we'll hear from the senior staff who were supporting the Liberal government, including some of the Prime Minister's close advisors. Janice McGregor is watching the inquiry in Ottawa and paying close attention to the details. And Janice, Where is the paper trail taking us now? Marcia, the deeper we get into the evidence, the more it appears that when the leaks about foreign election meddling hit the news, it shouldn't have been news to those at the centre of Justin Trudeau's government. Yesterday, the inquiry got specific briefing materials prepared by CSIS for the Prime Minister himself. Heavily redacted, yes. But even what was left suggested specific intelligence on interference by the People's Republic of China in both the 2019 and the 2021 elections. Serious enough that CSIS brought in senior players in the Liberal campaign to brief them about this intelligence in the middle of the election. Even during the caretaker period, security officials brought in Justin Trudeau to be briefed as Liberal leader. Nathalie Drain, who's now Trudeau's national security advisor, but during these elections was on the panel of senior bureaucrats in charge of sounding the alarm to the public if a serious threat emerged. She told the inquiry that the panel thought sharing their intelligence about what happened at the nomination meeting in the Toronto riding of Don Valley North was a way to mitigate the threat in 2019, even though it didn't stop Handong from becoming an MP. It is not the role of the panel to give advice to any parties in terms of who can be a candidate or not. Yes. Um, So you didn't put two and two together after the election? No. This inquiry is grappling with to what extent sunshine can be the best disinfectant, even as it probes whether Trudeau's government should be saying more about what it knows. It is increasingly clear it sure knew more than what it said at the time. Thank you, Janice. You're welcome. The CBC's Janice McGregor in Ottawa. The man who murdered four members of a Muslim family in London, Ontario, is seeking to appeal his convictions. In February, Nathaniel Veltman was found guilty of four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. CBC News has found that a Toronto lab that sold a common prenatal paternity test had a pattern of identifying the wrong dads. The test matches fetal DNA 
in the mother's blood with the father. Jorge Barrera reports. Yeah, it's like as soon as I saw those test results, immediately right then and there, things just changed. My Before the changed. baby was even born, John Brennan was told by Viagard Acumetrics in 2015 that he was the father. But less than a year later, the Atlanta, Georgia resident found out the lab test was wrong. And so you're left in this mysterious, dark place mentally. And Brennan was not alone. A CBC News investigation has found Viagard Acumetrics had a 10-year history of IDing wrong dads across Canada, the U.S. and overseas. Um, people were also very scared to call because they, they used to get told off. So Sika Risho worked less than three months for the lab handling customer inquiries. Sometimes they'll say, I sent two tests in and I got different results. That happened as well, yes. That happened a lot. They said I did it twice because I wanted to be sure. She alleges employees were coached to ask women about their menstrual cycles, information DNA tests don't need. Then lab owner Harvey Tenenbaum would sometimes look over results and make guesses at paternity. He would always make a comment like, oh, well, it's definitely this one. It's this, it's this one. It's this one. It's got to be this one. She doesn't know if those are the results customers received. Tenenbaum ignored multiple CBC requests for interviews, but when approached outside his lab, Dr. Harvey Tenenbaum, hey. he said mistakes happen. Well, you know, you do tests? thousands of tests, and half the errors are the collection problem. Vigard stopped doing prenatal paternity tests in 2021, but it's still in the business of testing babies after they're born. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Ottawa. It's a sort of homecoming for two Russian acrobats who defected to Canada in 1992. They fled the Moscow Circus. The couple vaulted into a new life in Newfoundland, then started performing across North America. Now they are back in St. John's to thank the women who helped them start over. Mark Quinn has the story. Three decades ago, seven Russians found safe haven in St. John's. They were returning from a performance in South America and made their daring move to defect as their plane refueled in Gander. Alex Arestov was one of the seven. He says it was frightening. I knew just two words, hi and goodbye. <laughs> so... They were highly trained acrobats, schooled at the Moscow Circus, and they needed a place to keep up their skills. Arestov said when they found the Cygnus Gymnastics Club in St. John's, it was a perfect fit. You know, a miracle. So, wow, we find a place, maybe we can practice here. Judy Tulk was the club's manager. She helped the Russians continue to train, work and navigate immigration. The Arestovs have flourished. Now in their 60s, husband and wife Alex and Elena continue to tour North America, performing together. Alex said they had to take a break and returned to St. John's to thank Tulk and celebrate her 80th birthday. She's like my mom. She do everything and uh, she took my hand and your step in Canada. Talk says she's received much more than she's given. I don't know, it's just utter happiness. There's dozens of people who would have done the same thing. It was actually an experience and a joy. The Arrestoffs promise they'll be back for Talk's 90th and 100th birthdays too. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. And that is the latest national and international news from World Report News Anytime at cbcnews.ca. I'm Marcia Young. Good morning, Manitoba. So you over all the eclipse excitement? Wow, there's some gorgeous photos online from yesterday. I'm Marcy Marcusa. We're live downtown in Winnipeg on 89.3 FM on CBC. Thanks so much for uh, joining us this morning. You might also be watching on YouTube or on the uh, listening on the app. It is uh, going to be a really uh, quite a nice day. Abby's in with the forecast in a moment. Just looking though at our current temperature. Overnight we've city, been sitting at around 3 degrees and that's exactly where we are this morning. This hour on the program, we're going to hear how some grade school kids in Winnipeg celebrated the eclipse yesterday, so stay tuned. Also, we're going to hear about a new CBC gem comedy drama that's tackling depression in the South Asian community. It's called Get Up, Aisha. It's a six-part comedy series, so we're going to hear more about it. And then we have Ottawa Report as well. That's just before 7. Stay with us.
First, let's go to Heather Walls and find out what is uh, making news this morning. Hello there. Good morning. Well, the town of the Paw has lost an iconic historic theater in a fire. The Lido Theater caught fire early yesterday morning. It's expected to be a total loss. The nearly 100-year-old theater underwent renovations in 2020, but it's been closed since the pandemic. The Paw's mayor says it's heartbreaking. We're going to hear more from Andre Murphy coming up. And the opposition conservatives say the government isn't being transparent about how many new health care workers it's hired. Uh, the NDP won't reveal how many health care workers have been hired since it took power six months ago. The government has announced more hospital beds and facilities in the last few days, but the Tory health critic worries they're not being staffed by new workers. I'll be back with more Manitoba News at 6.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Remember, anything Heather brings uh, to us on the air, there's always more you can read about online as well. So cbc.ca slash Manitoba is where you should check that out. Let's get into our morning uh, weather and commute. Let's start with the weather. Abby Adiemi, welcome back. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you, Massey. How are you doing today? I'm great. This uh, weather is really nice. I'm enjoying the spring feeling out there. But still crispy. Yeah, a little, just a little, a little bit. bit you know, a little still bit. a bit crispy. We, we, currently, we are at uh, three degrees on the clear skies. Beautiful beginning into the day. Throughout the day, we can expect, I call it a delightful mix of sun and clouds. Then there's a gradual clearing up as the afternoon period gets closer. Temperatures will be rising to a comfortable 15 degrees today, making it a perfect day for, you know, outdoor activities, if that's what you're into. Now, as we move into the night period, the skies will initially remain clear, then the clouds will roll in and we'll see some cloud cover. That's going to be what we will see all night into after midnight and if you're planning any late night adventures like star gazing or whatever it might be cloudy for that but uh stay warm looking at wednesday we anticipate some mainly cloudy conditions and a chance of showers in the afternoon but today's forecast i'll tell you mixed bag nothing to complain about from my end yeah agreed all right we're going to talk about the eclipse you're probably wondering why are you talking to abby you love stargazing uh we'll do that in a moment uh first let's get through uh some more things that'll affect your day so the commute uh corey yeah, really, so far, a pretty straightforward commute. I haven't heard anything on the commuter line. Bike ride was good on the way in. Highways look pretty smooth. But if you do see something going on, if you're walking, bike, and driving, give me a call. 204-788-3093. I got to ask you something just before we move on here. So you brought mm -hmm. your bike this morning. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but you were about to uh, go on and embark on an epic run. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, heading to Portland on Thursday. And on Saturday, I've got a doing the... Gorge Waterfalls 100K. 100 kilometers. Yes, running along the Columbia River, which is the river that kind of separates Washington and Oregon. Amazing. And uh, it's 100K, and it's going to be really hard, <laughs> <laughs> but really fun. Now, remind me, you've done this before this distance? Never. I've never. Uh, the oh, your, your, longest, your wife has. Uh, no, actually. No, I no, thought Annika did. No, 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 both of us. Oh my the, gosh. the longest both of us ever done is 50K, Kay. so twice that. For some reason, <laughs> I thought one of you was already, so that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess combined, we've done 100K, but. Wow. No, not uh, no. So this is going to be a totally new thing. I'm hoping that there's so it's all like there's waterfalls kind of lining the whole kind of trail. So Beautiful. we're just gonna. I'm hoping that I just go waterfall to waterfall. That'll motivate me. Oh, well, we're excited for you. <laughs> Thanks. We'll, fun. we'll talk more about it. I know you're still on the show tomorrow, but we'll have to find a place where we can cheer for you and oh, watch yeah. your progress <laughs> yes, from thanks. here at home. Uh, if you are running in this morning or biking, uh, as Corey did this morning, uh, as he said, should be beautiful conditions. And once again, seven eight eight three zero nine three. And certainly here in Manitoba, people spent yesterday afternoon looking up with glasses on to properly protect their eyes. We didn't have the greatest view of the eclipse yesterday here in Manitoba, but we still did get something. And uh, there's photos to prove it. If you go on our uh, Facebook page this morning, my CBC Marcy Marcusa page, uh, I posted uh, video and photos from all kinds of different uh, places. Now, some of them are taken in Manitoba. Some of them are Manitobans who were away for the eclipse. Uh, Kristen Andrews took a, a photo in uh, Playa Novelero. She was down in Mexico 
through welding glass and just looks like this green sort of star shape. Just beautiful. Uh, totality in Montreal. Alison Clement sharing a photo from there. Some of the photos from out east were just incredible. And some of those live moments watching the uh, darkness come and the quiet, the temperature drop. Quite emotional as well as uh, some people actually were sort of either lost for words a lot of reporters, actually, yesterday afternoon, lost for words, uh, which is okay, because it really was all about the moment of the eclipse, however you were experiencing it. Other people in tears. Uh, some of my favorite photos, actually, are just interesting vantage points. If you go on my Facebook page, some of the photos taken here in Manitoba, uh, Phoebe uh, uh, Mann shared one, uh, just gorgeous. It was just sort of the eclipse reflecting in a puddle. And uh, just the way that, that that juxtaposition looks is amazing. Now, yes, Abby was off the show yesterday and was certainly out with his uh, telescope. So where were you? I was uh, just at the uh, southern end of the city at Liberia Park, and it was really, really gorgeous. Just to add to what Phoebe said, that was actually how we used to check it out. When we're way, way little, you just go to a pool or a pond somewhere where the water is still, and you'd see the reflection of the sun, and you'd notice how the moon crosses path. Did you notice uh, one of the most amazing photos to me was taken from an airplane and it's the CN Tower and yeah. it was the eclipse and it's almost like right behind it. I've got I've got that shared on my page as well. It's beautiful. I, it was beautiful. I got a video from a friend in Dallas from her sky rise building and how it happened all the transition from daylight all the way into total darkness. So cool. So cool. A lot of people are going to be changing their screensavers today, I think, on their phones and, and I, devices. I'm so sad about people saying, hey, we're not going to see it in our lifetime again, not till 2044. But I'm saying this is something that actually happens like almost every three years, somewhere on this in planet, actually. Yeah, go traveling. Somewhere. Just go traveling. <laughs> exactly. Go chase it. The next one, I think, will be 2026, but it's mostly the Arctic, uh, Greenland, Spain and a part of uh, uh, the UK. All so, places that sound wonderful to visit. Yeah, wonderful to visit. Maybe we Spain's on my bucket list. Go, so. Then go travel 2026 right? in the city of Eclipse. Let's find out how people did make the best of it here. If you want to see Abby's photos, by the way, from La Barrier Park uh, through the telescope as well, he's got some beautiful shots and some great video that he shared too. That's also in the thread on my Facebook page. But uh, as mentioned, let's hear for a moment how some people were excited about this yesterday in Winnipeg, some of the uh, youngest people. Uh, CBC's Jim Agapito watched the event with students in Winnipeg from a Coal River Heights, and here's what they had to say. How excited are you for the eclipse today? Penelope yeah! Sala. <laughs> okay, it's about, I would say, five minutes until the eclipse starts happening. What are you excited to see today? Well, I'm excited to see how dark it gets outside. Joseph Henderson. Now, I see that you're wearing the shades already and you're getting ready to watch the eclipse. Tell me, tell me, how excited are you right now? I'm like, 10 out of 10, really excited. Yeah. Why, why are you that excited? Because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and we get to see the moon go in front of the sun and yeah, astronomy. How have you been preparing for this? Mostly I've learned how it damages your eyes, <laughs> but like also the different types of eclipse, eclipses, like total and lunar and whatever. Are you going to rub it in that your family might uh, or your parents might have to be at work and not be able to see this? Um, probably, yeah. I don't know if, I don't even know if they know. Hi, I'm Bennett Johnson. I'm pretty excited. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Let's take a look at that screen over there. You can see it happening. NASA has that path. Their teachers put it on. How does that make you feel? Uh, it's pretty cool. It makes me feel pretty lucky to have that uh, experience. Once in a lifetime, how does it feel to share it with your friend? What's your name? Coleman Darges. Describe for me what you're, what you're seeing here. What um, you seeing here on the screen? I see that uh, totality is going away and that the sun is um, re-entering the Earth's like view. It keep, the moon keeps going left on the screen and the sun is getting like um, brighter. Do you feel any different now that you're you're watching this happen? Yeah, it's pretty cool because this is a once in a lifetime like thing, and I don't think I'll ever be able to see this again. It's crazy.
Well, they're young enough that, as Abby said, they should be able to go traveling and certainly see it again. And in 20 years here in Manitoba, we're going to have uh, at least a partial eclipse coming back. Now, they were watching on screen, of course, uh, but then they also did get a chance to head outside to see the partial eclipse here. Despite the cloud cover, it actually was just sort of clear enough that we did get some views. So Jim was there for that reaction as well. Whoa. 33, 40%. Yeah. Oh, they felt oh, yeah. <laughs> Joe, you're wearing the glasses. What if you're laughing and suddenly you're the glasses? It's an LP What are you seeing? Oh. <laughs> I'm seeing the sun, but in the shape of the moon. Um, and it's like a little bit orange, yellowy. And it's kind of just like a little dot in the sky, and it's really far away. It's very small. Mm -hmm. uh, Samantha to it. Yeah. But it's like pretty bright, so you could see it. Okay, you said it'll look small and like a what again? Um, it's like small and like a moon, but like upside down. Kind of, it's like this, kind of. I don't really know how to make the shape, but it's like... Yeah, it looks like a fortune cookie. That's, what, that's exactly that's what it looks like. Are you excited that you actually got to see it? Yeah, definitely. Because like a lot of people haven't seen like solar eclipses before. Like it doesn't even look real, it looks fake. It yeah. is a little bit blurry because of the clouds, but it looks, it's really cool. Yeah, I agree. It doesn't seem real. CBC's Jim Agapito speaking to grade 7 students at a Coal River Heights uh, school in Winnipeg about the eclipse yesterday. Now, speaking of things that uh, seem real or don't seem real, uh, don't get duped by photos online like I did. Apparently, and I was really careful yesterday trying to source everything, but apparently that one photo that I was just mentioning to Abby, which is still pretty cool, is photoshopped. The one that, uh, the CN Tower one with the eclipse. Uh, apparently our colleagues at CBC in Toronto uh, were like, is this real? Is it not? And they looked into it. So it's still a pretty good Photoshop, but it's not real. So don't get duped by that one. But if you have a photo uh, of the eclipse yesterday to share from anywhere you were uh, around the world or here in Manitoba, please do. You can post directly to our Facebook page. It is my Marcy Marcusa page and it acts as a show page when we're on the air. For breaking news as it happens, stay with CBC News. For the latest updates and what it means for Canadians, stay with CBC News. When the biggest stories break, both at home and around the world, Stay with CBC News. It is 6.23 a.m. right now on 89.3 FM, 9.90 a.m. or on the uh, app this morning. Thanks for being with us. I'm Marcy Marcusa, Corey and Abby and Brad behind the glass. It is uh, cloudy and three degrees in Winnipeg and Windsor Calm. Well, as I've been mentioning, there's a new CBC series that's going to take a look at depression in the South Asian community. Uh, but it's a comedy drama series. It's the story of Aisha Raiman, a grade A student and loving daughter. Have a listen. <laughs> Perfect, right? On the outside, my life feels like a sitcom. But on the inside, it's a whole different story. That's somewhat of the premise of Get Up, Aisha. It's a new dramatic comedy, as I mentioned. Uh, it will be released in six parts on CBC Gem tomorrow. But to talk about it, uh, Rabia Mansour is with us. She's the co-creator of the series. Good morning. Good morning. So excited to be here. I bet you're excited about this coming out after you know thinking and working on it. What inspired you to focus on this story like this? Oh, um, so myself and the other two co-creators all come from the South Asian community. And in our experiences and the experience of our loved ones as well, talking about mental health and depression is really taboo as a community conversation. And so when we were thinking about, you know, the next project we wanted to work on, we, we really wanted to start a conversation um, about mental health in the South Asian community and create a show that you know, parents could watch with their, um, like, adult children, um, you know, teenagers could watch with their parents, and just to start a conversation uh, between generations within the community um, about mental health. Um, so, yeah, super excited for, for tomorrow's release. Um, does the uh, taboo in the South Asian community around depression, you mentioned, is it a generational shift, or is it a, is it a, a, does it live uh, culturally? Honestly, I think there are shifting attitudes um, in the younger generations, but I would still say it is quite taboo as a community conversation. I think there is still like a lot of pressure. I know I faced it um, for my own parents about even if it's something that I want to be open and share with the world or just with uh, my own community, my parents are like, ooh, like it would be great if you didn't share that. Like, do you really have to share that with the world? And I think 
that pressure coming downwards definitely is something that my generation and the generations after me like internalize. And so it gets carried on in that way. Um, depression can be very difficult to depict accurately. What experiences did you draw on when you were uh, writing the show? So we drew on our own like personal experiences. Depression is something that I've struggled with as well in the past. And what was really important for us when it came to writing the series was to show a different side of depression. Oftentimes we see depression as someone who is lying in bed, crying, unable to get up, which is totally valid and definitely one side of depression that folks experience. But the side that sometimes gets missed out in the conversation is folks who put on a brave face, you know, are um, high achieving and but they're really struggling on the inside. And because people don't know what that inner turmoil looks like or understand it, they think that person is totally fine and they're just living, you know, their life. And so we really wanted to focus on that aspect of uh, depression just to show people that even if someone looks like they're doing totally fine, they may be falling apart on the inside. And so it's important to check in with your friends, with your loved ones, and just ask them how they're doing, you know, and and just make sure that everyone's doing okay, because life is hard enough as it is. Two speeds, right? The outside and the inside, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Get Up Aisha is also a comedy. So how does that factor in, and how does humor help with what we're talking about? Yeah, it was really important for us to have um, a comedic element to the show, because Life, even in its darkest moments, has these absurd moments of comedy throughout it, you know, Um, like mistakes at a funeral, um, things like that. And so we really wanted to be true to what life is like um, in our day to day. Um, It's not all sad. It's not all happy. It's really a marriage of the two. And not only that, but with comedy, if we're able to tell some jokes, you know, disarm people with laughter, we feel like they're able to engage more and and listen to what we're trying to say and to the and and be excited about these broader community conversations. So it was really important for us to to have those moments of levity throughout. Okay, I can't help but ask. Mistakes at a funeral. Yes. Is yeah. that an episode or a real life story? What are you talking about there? <laughs> uh no, uh, it was actually a, a friend's uh, story <laughs> of mine, um, where uh they were lowering um the casket and I guess I don't know if they had mismeasured or something but it was a bit of a bumpy ride on the way oh, down no. uh, yeah <laughs> so it was just you can't just help but laugh in those moments so, yeah right yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I've shared this story on the air before but it's come to mind because you're talking about uh, you know being at the cemetery where you're kind of you know usually somber and um, they spelled my 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 father's mother my grandmother her name was incorrectly spelled on the on the stone Oh, my God. And I said to my dad, her name's Vicky. And I said, Dad, I said, why is it spelled V-I-C-K-Y? And he said, well, it's, that's Vicky. And I said, you did that? And he said, yeah. I said, but it's spelled with an I. I said, and he said, I said, look at every card she ever wrote in her life. Baba Vicky. And he said, she always signed my cards, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, you have an Eat episode coming out tomorrow, obviously appropriately timed. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So um, Eat for me growing up um, was just such a big community event. It's really a time for me to, you know, there's so many people I don't see in my day to day, but I'll see on Eat. And so um, in the last episode, things have totally fallen apart for Aisha. And she's really able to finally let the other people into her life. And that turning point happens during Eid. Um, She's in the mosque. um, She's praying in congregation. And that is just such a turning point for her. And that was really important for us because so much of depression and mental health issues can can just feel like you're struggling alone and that you have to suffer through it alone. You can't talk to people. And we wanted to show that when Aisha is in community and she feels that like that support around her um, from the people she knows and some of the people people that she doesn't know that she can really make it through and see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so, yeah, it was really important for us to to show that. Good luck with the series, Robbie. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you so much. That's uh, Robbie Mansour. She's a writer and co-creator of Get Up, Aisha, on CBC Gems. So uh, the six-part series that will be available to stream starting tomorrow. It is right now time for your CBC Winnipeg News. <laughs> This is CBC News. 
Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 6.30, we're starting Tuesday off at 3 degrees. We're going to see a mix of sun and clouds this morning and then becoming mostly sunny by afternoon, warming up again to 15 this afternoon. The town of the Paw has lost an iconic historic theater in a fire. The Lido Theater caught fire early yesterday morning and is expected to be a total loss. The nearly 100-year-old theater underwent renovations in 2020 but has been closed since the pandemic. The Paw recently acquired the building and was putting $50,000 towards cleaning up and revitalizing the space. The Paw mayor, Andre Murphy, says it is a heartbreaking loss. Pulls on your heart a little bit. Us that grew up in this in the community, uh, Saturday matinees with uh, 25 cents and uh, got a bag of popcorn and a pop and a chocolate bar and, and then acted out the movie on the way home. Um, so, yeah, no, we uh, it's, it is absolutely devastating. Murphy says the building must be torn down because it now poses a safety issue. The cause of the fire has not been released. The opposition Conservatives want to know how many new health care workers the government has hired. The NDP won't disclose that number. The government announced more hospital beds and facilities over the last few days. But Tory health critic Kathleen Cook worries the government's just moving around existing workers. Cook pressured the health minister in question period yesterday to reveal how many new workers have been hired. Now we're seeing an unwillingness to be transparent about staffing numbers. The minister and their department should have those numbers readily available. And certainly when they were in opposition, the now minister was adamant that this information should be transparent and available to Manitobans, and now that they're in power, uh, we're not seeing that transparency. Cook says the government promised to update wait times for patients. She says the latest online data is from January. A Winnipeg woman is desperate to get her husband home after he has spent more than a month in hospital in Mazatlan, Mexico. Stacy Conway says her husband, Jim Gibbons, went into hospital March 5th after a scratch on his leg turned into threatening sepsis. She contacted their insurance company, who said it would book an air ambulance to fly him home when he was fit to fly. Conway says when he was given the all-clear... Sun Life told her the WRHA said there were no beds for him. Conway says the WRHA told her there, in fact, was a bed waiting for him. But now she says flights keep getting cancelled. This is just a joke now. Like, since March 22nd, he's been sitting in the hospital. They unhooked his IV three days ago because they thought he was flying out. So he's sitting in a hospital room. No one comes in to see him. There's no nurses, no doctors. Conway was told her husband may be able to fly home on Friday. In a statement, Sun Life says when it's arranging to send a patient back to Canada, a hospital bed must be available. The WRHA tells CBC a lack of beds was not a barrier in Gibbon's case. Ottawa's nationwide cap of international students means even tighter competition just to be considered. The province advocated for more than 18,000 attestation letters after Ottawa proposed about 15,000. Now, those letters confirm Manitoba's approval for students but don't guarantee a spot. Renee Cable is Manitoba's Minister of Advanced Education and Training. We know that our institutions provide quality education. We know that we have room for them and frankly we want international students here and we want them to stay and build a life here in Manitoba. So, you know, while it was disappointing, I think that we can say proudly that we worked hard to ensure that we got our fair share. Cable says the province will continue to work with its post-secondary schools and the federal government. Well, despite ongoing pressure from across the global community, Israel says it will go ahead with its plan to launch a military operation in Rafah. It's estimated more than a million displaced Palestinians are currently in Rafah, but Israel insists the city also houses the remains of the Hamas power structure and a full military campaign, it says, is the only option. A vigil was held last night for the victims of the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Family and friends held a prayer service in a candlelight procession. Six people, all migrants, were killed as they worked on the bridge repairing potholes. After a cargo ship experienced power failure and crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing it to collapse, the bodies of three of the deceased workers have been recovered, and the search continues for the other three. You can hear the latest national and international news on World Report at 7. March was another record-hot month for the planet. New data released today by Europe's climate 
Climate Agency shows last month averaged 14.14 degrees Celsius. It pushes past the previous record from 2016 by a tenth of a degree. March is the 10th consecutive month of record-breaking temperatures. Climate scientists attribute most of the record heat to human-caused climate change from carbon dioxide and methane emissions. You can find more news updated throughout your day. Just head to our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. All right, thanks, Heather Wells. You're welcome. It's time for our regional forecast now. Abby Adiemi is uh, looking around Manitoba. And what are we seeing? A bit of mixed bag. That's what we're seeing across the province this morning. Today's forecast is actually going to be bringing a mix of sun and clouds across the province. We've got a blend of sun and clouds lined up. Then it's going to be clearing up nicely as we roll into the afternoon period. It's actually shaping to be quite a pleasant day uh, outside. The temperatures will be reaching highs of uh, 15 degrees as we head into the evening. Brandon is currently at minus one, partly cloudy out there. Moving north to Thompson, it's currently zero and mostly cloudy. Further north in Churchill, it's currently minus four degrees and mainly clear today will start with uh, increasing cloudiness in the morning and then they will be seeing a high of uh, six degrees down in Dauphin it's currently minus one and clear we should be seeing a mix of sun and cloud and clearing later this morning high of 16 Gimli is currently at two degrees under partly cloudy skies the interlake region will be clearing up later and then we will see a mix of sun and clouds heading to a high of 12 Steinbeck is currently at one partly cloudy. Finally, Morris, it's one degree and um, it's kind of minus one now, partly cloudy. Uh, the Pemina Valley region will also see a mix of sun and clouds today with clearing as uh, the morning progresses. But Winnipeg here, we're heading to a high, a comfortable high of 15. All right. Thank you, Abby. You're welcome. Corey Funk, how's the commute going? Yeah, so far it seems pretty straightforward. Highways uh, are clear, roads are clear, uh, bike lanes were nice on the way in for myself this morning uh, through West Broadway. But if you see something going on, if you're walking, biking, driving, give me a call on the CBC commuter line. That number to call, 204-788-3093. Three. All right. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Let's get to uh, business news uh, next with Crystal Lee Ramlikan. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, Marcy. So the Bank of Canada, let's start there. The next interest rate announcement is scheduled for tomorrow. And what are we thinking it's going to be like? Yes. So, uh, you know, it's widely expected to keep its key overnight rate on hold as it gathers more evidence of cooling inflation. But uh, the money markets bet the first interest rate cut in four years could come as early as June. Now, in the space of 17 months, the central bank raised the key interest rate to 5 percent and has held there since last July. Now, while that helped cool inflation to 2.8 percent from that peak of 8.1 percent that we saw in June 2020, it has impacted mortgage costs and slowed spending. But, uh, you know, the bank risks fueling a rally in housing prices, which was a key component that uh, drove inflation with a premature rate cut. But, you know, economists say the economy is quite frail right now. Bankruptcy rates for businesses are skyrocketing, profits are down, and inventories are high. And uh, consumer spending is just being held up by the increase in population. And many first-time home buyers and renters are waiting in the wings to jump back into the market as borrowing costs fall from a 22-year peak. And uh, Marcy, the bank is also set to release projections on the economy and inflation as well tomorrow. Let's go to another story. How are Canadians feeling about their financial situations right now? I guess it's connected, not really another story. Uh, yeah, for sure. One definitely flows into the other. So Canadians are feeling a little more optimistic about their debt with the prospect of interest rate cuts on the horizon. So that's according to the latest report from insolvency firm MNP. Now, more than a quarter feel their current debt situation is better than a year ago. But despite the uptick in sentiment, households are still feeling the squeeze as more mortgage renewals loom and the cost of living continues to rise. So half say they are concerned about spending money on their lifestyle or on social obligations. Wesley Cowan is a licensed insolvency trustee with MNP. 
About a third of Canadians say they still haven't fully recovered uh, from the pandemic. There was a couple of years there where things were unpredictable and and people weren't sure about their situation. Some folks did manage to save some money during that period of time, but a lot of that has been used up now by trying to catch up with things that they maybe fell behind on at the time. And they got a break from their creditors. The creditors were, you know, trying to be understanding and maybe not pressuring people for payments as much. But, you know, once we came out of the pandemic, then a lot of those things, you know, came back for people to have to deal with. Now, while fewer are concerned about their ability to repay their debts, nearly half of respondents say they are $200 or less away from failing to meet all of their financial obligations. That's tight. Uh, Mm -hmm. Why are engaged couples cutting back on weddings? Well, people, you know, were very excited to hold lavish weddings after a backlog during the pandemic. But inflation started to soar and the average cost of a wedding broke $30,000 last year in the U.S. at least. And that's according to The Wedding Report, a research company that tracks wedding data. Now, after two years of elevated inflation, splurging on a fancy wedding has just become much less justifiable. And of course, that's bad news for wedding vendors and businesses. There's also a looming drop in the overall number of weddings. In the U.S., weddings soared to a 25-year high in 2022, and nearly 17% fewer weddings are expected this year. Now, one theory is because single people who stayed inside in 2020 may not have gotten an opportunity to go on dates and therefore are not engaged right now or not, you know, far enough along in their relationship to be engaged. Uh, Jewelry companies say they are also seeing the number of engagements decline as well uh, due to the disruption of dating three and a half years ago. And that is something that they pay close attention to because, you know, their business is engagement rings. Um, And also, you know, some younger people are placing less importance on getting married or having a big wedding as uh, an increasing number of people are cohabitating instead of getting married. And I got to say, let's just bust the myth right now. For the bridesmaids, you're, if you do have a wedding, you're never going to wear the dress again. You're not going to You're not going <laughs> to cut it down. You're not going to reinvent it. You're not going to add a sweater. You're not wearing that dress again. <sighs> I know, because you think, no, I could, I could. But then you're like, and then if you wear it around your friends who are probably at the wedding, they're like, are you wearing a bridesmaid's dress? <laughs> like, maybe if the couple has an anniversary party and you're showing up as the bridesmaid, like, maybe. Maybe, yeah, yeah that could, that could that, be that special. Could happen, but yeah. <laughs> uh, what's going on in the markets this morning, Crystal? So in Europe, markets are lower as investors look ahead to U.S. inflation data. Germany is down. The U.K. is up. France is down. In Asia, markets are mixed as investors assess Australia and Japan data. So Japan is up. Shanghai is up. Hong Kong is up. Oil is up 26 cents to 86.69 U.S. per barrel. Gold is up 1807 to $2,357.11 U.S. per ounce. And the dollar is up 0.03 of a cent to 73. 71 cents US. All right, Crystal Lee, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay, thanks, Marcy. With Business News, that's Crystal Lee Ramlikan. We have new music on the show next. It's just out today from Winnipeg producer Lev Snow. This one's called How Dandy. I'm not above the torments of life. But with you I feel just like celebrating Tonight we hunker down Turning speech to the sounds We'd wanna hear the clap Or if we were above uncertainty Sandy lions handed up to you. Should I expect you want them to grow into better things when better things disguise your needs and wonder? Of before, 
Hesitation will become my final form When daybreak turns its face Clearly out of place In vain what you can't shake in this exchange Is it changing the way That is new music out today from Winnipeg's Lev Snow. It's called How Dandy. Six forty six AM is a time right now on eighty nine three FM, nine ninety AM. Thanks so much for joining us on CBC. I'm Marcy Marcusa with our team here at the show. It's uh, cloudy and it's three degrees in the city of Winnipeg. In Brandon right now, it's partly cloudy minus one. Thompson's mostly cloudy and zero. And in the city today, we're gonna head for a high of fifteen degrees, and we are expecting some sun and cloud. Cloudy into tonight, chance of showers, and then tomorrow, sunny skies. Uh, in a high of 14 degrees. And it should stay clear, actually, then uh, pretty much right through Saturday if the forecast holds. It's going to be really warm on the weekend. Well, we were in St. Laurent, Manitoba recently for Communities in Focus. That's a CBC initiative to basically focus on a community. And we head out with a team of uh, reporters and producers, and uh, basically we share the stories of people uh, from that area and take some real time. Our reporters stay for a full week and just uh, learn and listen about areas. One of the things that a lot of people talked to us when we were in St. Laurent around Lake Manitoba was the fact that it's a migratory path for birds. And so the bird watching is uh, beautiful on that lake in our province. On any given night right now, hundreds of thousands of birds are migrating all across North America. So that might be a good spot to see this in Manitoba. And this is largely done though under the cover of darkness, but it's not quiet. How our feathered friends communicate can teach us a lot. So let's lean into that next on the show. Dan Mendel is a biology professor at the University of Windsor. He is studying the noise of migration. We've been studying migration as, uh, as scientists for many, many decades, originally by watching birds, staring at the moon and watching how many birds cross the moon through a telescope. And then more recently with radar technology and then with a little miniature tags that we can attach to birds and track them as they migrate. But I'm really interested in studying migrants by studying their sounds. And as the birds fly through the night sky, they produce very quiet calls. They sound like quiet little whispers, but you can hear them without a microphone or anything. If you go out for a walk at dusk or at dawn, you can hear up in the sky these sounds that almost sound like little cricket noises or something, but those are the sounds produced by migratory songbirds as they're on the wing. And so my research team at the University of Windsor has led the investigation of studying bird migration by pointing microphones up at the night sky and seeing what we can learn about birds by recording them as they're on the move. Although they sound the same to us, we have found that each different species has a different kind of flight call. And different researchers studying this phenomenon in different parts of the world have all collected their own database. And as we build those databases and bring them together, we find that we can reliably distinguish an American red start from a yellow warbler because their sounds are slightly different, not by listening to them, but by collecting the recording them, bringing them back to a sound analysis lab like my laboratory at University of Windsor and calling them up as a sound spectrogram. And we can say, oh, that one was a yellow warbler, that one was an American red star. And that gives us a really interesting scientific tool because we can, by recording, 
fall after fall, spring after spring, the number of red starts and the number of yellow warblers and the number of all the other species that produce these calls and track whether their numbers are increasing or decreasing and whether their timing of their migration varies with global climate change and address other really important conservation type questions through those long term recording data sets. Cool, right? That's uh, Dan Mennell. He's a biology professor at the University of Windsor. By the way, if you uh, want to check out different events that are going on this spring, if you're a bird lover and you follow migratory events, uh, this is probably a pretty good month to do so. A lot of them happen in May, but uh, because of the way that the weather's been, we're already seeing sort of uh, a lot of the uh, migration patterns that happen a little bit earlier even in the season. So you can check out a number of different sites, including, of course, Okamek or Fort White, uh, locally here in Winnipeg. And you can also check out naturemanitoba.com. I'm Marcy Marcusa. Thanks so much for being with us this morning. Uh, Next on the show, it's time to turn our attention to uh, politics in Ottawa. Stage one of the public hearings into foreign interference are winding down tomorrow. It's the year-long inquiry that's focusing on how foreign actors may have interfered in two federal elections in this country. It's also considering whether the government and its agencies have the ability to detect and counter such interventions which is critical. Of course, next year we have a federal election in this country. Now, in recent days, the focus, though, has shifted from China to India. Ryan Tumulty is here to talk about that. He's parliamentary reporter with the National Post. Good morning. Good morning. So what stands out for you, uh, given what we've heard so far from the witnesses that are at this inquiry? Yeah, well, you know, I would say a lot of what we've heard is what we were hearing last year. Uh, But what we're hearing now is in greater depth. You know, we're, we're getting a real picture of what was sort of a concentrated effort uh, to influence both the 2019 and 2021 elections um, from a variety of countries, it seems like, uh, but especially China uh, seems to have wanted to influence the outcome of our votes. Um, you know, and I, I would say that one of the things that's been interesting is, and we've heard them in the past few days, you know, during elections, uh, the way the government works is that bureaucrats are left in charge of monitoring this issue. Um, And they are the ones who decide whether or not to sort of raise the red flag about foreign interference happening during a campaign. Um, And those bureaucrats have talked about, you know, just what a fine line that is. Uh, The the challenge of coming forward and saying that there is foreign interference here. Uh, You know, they talk about it having to be a very high bar, but also aware that just making that public announcement would have an influence on the vote as well. Now, tomorrow, as I mentioned, the inquiry is uh, is set to hear, I haven't mentioned this part, rather, but the Prime Minister is going to be before the inquiry, and this is before it moves to the next phase. So what are you going to be watching for uh, from him? Well, you know, I think there's some real specifics that um, we're all interested in. Um, we know he was warned, for example, uh, about concerns uh, with one of his candidates, uh, the now independent MP, Han Dong. Uh, we know that there were other issues um, that have come up. Um, I would say that um, the one thing, though, that I am sort of looking for is an overall uh, takeaway from him. You know, how does he see the foreign interference situation? What has he been doing about it? You know, did he ignore some of these other briefings? Um, You know, he testified uh, in 2022 uh, uh, during the Emergencies Act inquiry, and he was quite candid. He was quite uh, expansive on his thoughts and his views on this issue in a way that he hadn't been. Uh, previously. So I'm, I'm interested to see if he brings that same sort of level of candor and really, you know, pulling back the curtain on his thinking uh, when it comes to this issue, when it comes to foreign interference. Who are some of the other key witnesses that are going to still be appearing? Yeah, so just today, for example, we have the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Katie Telford. Uh, we have a bunch of other cabinet ministers, a whole slew of people who were either in the position then or are in the position now. Uh, who can talk about foreign interference and what they witnessed. So I think there's a, a, a lot of interesting testimony still to come, and I think we'll you know, we'll hear more about what people at the sort of highest level of government were thinking about this. And just remind us again, when are we going to have this report? So we'll have a report in May. That's the first report. Um, it, will t- it will cover the issue of sort of what happened and what the government did or didn't do. Um, and then in the fall, they will move into more hearings about how to respond to this, come up with some recommendations, you know, and I think that's going to be a really challenging part. Some of the big influence campaigns we know were misinformation uh, being spread on social media, on platforms like WeChat. I think that is going to be very difficult for any government uh, to slow down. You know, misinformation on social media about politics is everywhere. Uh, so I don't know how they're going to address it. 
Uh, let's switch gears here. Uh, also yesterday in Ottawa, the Prime Minister, along with Defence Minister Bill Blair, announced their National Defence Policy Update. What are the key components of it? Yeah, so I mean, it's about $8 billion in new spending over the next five years, and sort of a broader pledge to spend about $70 billion over the next 20. Um, it's a significant amount of spending, um, brings in some tactical helicopters, um, some other material, they are talking about uh, expanding our ammunition production. You know, we know that's been a big issue with the war in Ukraine. Um, even talking about exploring the idea of a new submarine fleet. Um, so a lot of big ticket items and a lot of revamp of even how we buy things. Um, but I think, um, you know, overall, it, it's still not meeting that sort of NATO target um, that we have pledged to meet, that 2% of our GDP target. Uh, Canada is still going to be coming up short. What's the reaction been uh, from the opposition then to the new defense policy update? Yeah, so, you know, from the conservatives, we've said that, you know, we've said basically this is window dressing. The, the government isn't serious. Everything's on a, a long timeline and they're not being, you know, specific about their commitments. The NDP were disappointed as he not, not, you know, not seeing more help for military families and, and things like that. I think, you know, what's interesting about this is this is an issue that's going to dog whatever government is in power for the next decade or more. Um, you know, Canada's getting more pressure from our allies to spend more. Certainly the world is becoming more unstable. And I think, you know, we're seeing that in Ukraine and in other places. Um, and, you know, whoever is in power is going to have to address that. Ryan, thank you. Appreciate having you on. No problem. Take care. Ryan Tumulty, parliamentary reporter with the National Post. I'm Marcy Marcusi. You're listening to Information Radio on your Tuesday morning. Thanks for being with us. It is April the 9th, and uh, in Winnipeg it's cloudy and 3 degrees. We're heading for a high of 15, mix of sun and cloud. Should clear this afternoon, though, and then clear uh, for uh, most of the early evening. Tomorrow, though, chance of showers in Winnipeg, a high 15, before it clears again later in the week. Before we turn our attention to the morning commute, let's get morning headlines at 3 minutes to 7 a.m. with Heather Wells. Good morning. Well, a nearly 100-year-old theater in the Paw has burned to the ground. Fire broke out at the Lido Theater early yesterday morning. Former owner August Rivelin says losing the theater is going to have a big impact on the community. And Manitoba's Advanced Education and Training Minister says Ottawa's international student cap for post-secondary institutions has hurt this province. Manitoba is projected to see a 9% drop in the number of international students it can accept under the change. And uh, the minister, Renee Cable, calls the cap disappointing. I'll be back with more Manitoba news at 7.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Uh, well, I mentioned we're going to dip back into the commute here. So things are uh, looking really nice out there, actually. Sure, there's some puddles, a little bit of ice, but mostly it's dry, uh, really dry around the city of Winnipeg, at least. Give us a call if you need on the highway. If, uh, you know, let us know what it's like in your part of Manitoba. Or if you are in the city of Winnipeg, uh, what are you seeing? Of course, uh, yes, it's pothole season, we know. But some of them are absolutely worth reporting, especially if you're swerving around. So you can use the traffic line for that also and be careful because we do have more people running and on their bikes now especially this week so you're going to want to pay attention to the uh, rules of the road and share 788-3093 is our traffic line well coming up heather just mentioned the lido theater in the paw and we're going to hear more about uh, that and people sharing memories about that theater so stay tuned that's coming up uh, after seven o'clock on the show in addition speaking of memories winnipeg in 1873 well, it was an upstart that ignored the odds and would become the third largest city in Canada in just over three decades. The CBC's Darren Bernhard recently dug through archival images from the 1870s and then compared them to Winnipeg now to show how much our city has changed. As you can imagine, it's a lot. It's a really, really interesting historical piece, though. So if you want to read it, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. But Darren's going to be in in the next hour to talk all about it. And as you heard in the news yesterday, now that the weather is warming up, it's time to remind you about those pesky ticks. We're going to talk to a local vet about how to prevent tick-borne diseases in your pets. That's all coming up on Information Radio. World Report, though, is next. Stay with us.
on the current. Countries that have strong systems of primary care actually pay less per capita for health care and they get better outcomes than we do. Almost 7 million Canadians don't have a family doctor. Former Federal Health Minister Jane Philpott says that fixing that is easy and that it won't break the bank. Her prescription for fixing health care in Canada coming up on The Current. The Current with Matt Galloway. This morning at 837, 907 in Newfoundland and on the CBC Listen app. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. As of this month, Ontario police officers charged with a crime or professional misconduct can now be suspended without pay, but only in the most serious cases. A CBC investigation has revealed over the past decade, paid police suspensions have cost Ontario taxpayers $134 million. The CBC's Julie Ireton has been digging into the numbers. It's going to cost the public for any time an officer is suspended with pay. Eric Lamine is a criminology professor at Trent University. CBC shared the data with him and other academics, union executives and former police chiefs. It shows more than 450 police suspensions over the past decade that cost $134 million. This is an iceberg, right? And how much of this do we really not even know? No agency or government office keeps track or makes public police suspensions in Ontario. CBC collected data through publicly available information, including news releases and media reports. Allegations against officers include drunk driving, drug trafficking, gender-based violence and professional misconduct. Officers were paid to stay home for days, months, even years. The University of Guelph's Kate Puddister researches criminal justice policy. Another huge part of the conversation is the lack of transparency surrounding this and why transparency is so essential for police oversight and accountability. New legislation was brought in April 1st. It allows chiefs to suspend officers without pay, but only in the most serious cases. Jeff McGuire is with Ontario's Association of Chiefs of Police. There still will be, in my view, a number of police officers that are on suspension with pay that the chiefs don't feel is appropriate. By contrast, the police union says it's satisfied with the new provisions. Julie Ayrton, CBC News, Ottawa. A group of senior Swiss women are celebrating. They won a landmark ruling in a climate case in Europe's top human rights court. The group of 2,000 women argued heat waves driven by climate change exposed them to health risks and even early death. They say the Swiss Swiss government failed to act to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Anne Mayer is co-president of the group. She says as an older woman, she's very proud to have brought this issue to court. Maintenant, nous allons rester très attentive à ce que la Suisse Now she says her group will pay close attention to how Switzerland implements the court's decision. A government representative says finding the right way to address the ruling will take time. Also today, the court dismissed two other similar cases, one brought by Portuguese youth against 32 European governments and another by a former French mayor against the French government. The rulings cannot be appealed. March was another record hot month for the planet. New data released today by Europe's climate agency shows last month average 14.14 degrees Celsius. That pushes past the previous record from 2016 by a tenth of a degree. March is the tenth consecutive month of record breaking temperatures. Climate scientists attribute most of the record heat to human caused climate change from carbon dioxide and methane emissions. This morning at The Hague, Germany is defending its decision to send weapons to Israel and cancel funding to the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency. Germany is doing its utmost to live up to its responsibility vis-à-vis both the Israeli and the Palestinian people. Our history is the reason why Israel's security has been at the core of German foreign policy. Nicaragua brought Germany before the International Court of Justice, accusing it of facilitating genocide. But lawyers for Germany are arguing that that is a one-sided view of the issue. As a matter of fact, only four war weapons have been licensed for export since October 2023, three of which concern test or practice equipment. The minute we look closely, Nicaragua's accusations fall apart. 
The world court has not yet ruled on a case accusing Israel of committing genocide in Gaza. Israel denies the charge. Despite a growing number of warnings from the international community, Israel is gearing up for a military offensive in Rafah in southern Gaza. The CBC's Abi Kordasin is watching developments. As displaced Palestinians in Rafah are preparing for Eid tomorrow, this woman says despite the war and destruction, she's trying to make her children happy like they normally would be. There is global concern that a ground assault by IDF troops into that city would be catastrophic for the nearly 1.5 million people sheltering there. France, Egypt and Jordan have now jointly added to international calls for Israel to reconsider that military option. But there are reports Israel is buying 40,000 tents ahead of a planned evacuation. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu confirmed last night the operation is going ahead. He says to eliminate Hamas, Israeli troops must enter Rafah, a date, he says, has now been set. But he did not provide further details. Some in Israel have been protesting. They want him gone, pointing out Netanyahu hasn't achieved any of his war goals. He didn't achieve not the destruction of Hamas. We still have 133 hostages in, uh, in Gaza. I hope they're in Gaza. I hope they're alive. Ceasefire talks in Cairo may not bring much hope because Hamas says none of its demands have been included in the latest proposal. The militant group wants a full withdrawal of IDF troops, and it also wants Palestinians to be permitted to return to northern Gaza. Abby Kowalas in CBC News, London. The man who murdered four members of a Muslim family in London, Ontario, is seeking to appeal his convictions. In February, Nathaniel Veltman was found guilty of four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. The judge ruled he committed an act of terrorism when he drove his truck into the Afzal family in 2021. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. The public inquiry into foreign interference is providing fresh insight into the expulsion of a Chinese diplomat last year. Janice McGregor has the details. When Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie announced last May that Canada had expelled Chinese consular official Zhao Wei, she said Canada was sending a message to Beijing's diplomats that if they engage in interference, they'll be sent home. At the time, it looked like specific retaliation following the revelation that the family of Conservative Michael Chong was secretly targeted because the Chinese Communist Party objected to the MP's sharp criticism of its human rights abuses and foreign policy. Policy. But a testimony summary released at the inquiry Monday revealed that, in fact, the expulsion was the culmination of two years of diplomatic efforts. Canada raised foreign interference with Chinese officials dozens of times, issuing several diplomatic notes. They'd been back and forth about political meddling since 2021, but the diplomatic dispute only led to concrete action after it hit the news and became public. Janice McGregor, CBC News, Ottawa. An undocumented woman says she was denied an emergency C-section at an Edmonton hospital. Alberta Health Services says they're looking into why. Madeline Cummings has the latest. I'm starting to cry. Yeah. 35-year-old Perla Estrada says what happened to her on March 25th was not fair. She says a doctor who reviewed her ultrasound that day told her she needed an emergency C-section because her amniotic fluid was low. So she went to the labor and delivery unit at the Royal Alexandra Hospital with a friend. Estrada, who is from Mexico and does not have health insurance, says nurses told her she needed to pay $5,000 up front for the procedure or no doctor would see her. In that moment, I just, I think in my baby and my health too, but first in her. Estrada says she expected to be billed after the birth, but could not afford to pay that amount in advance. She then went to a second hospital run by a different provider. She said she received care right away at the Misericordia Hospital, and her daughter was born by C-section. Diana Ramirez is a community organizer who helped Estrada during her pregnancy. I don't think anybody should be withhold care, especially in an emergency situation. Jenna Hennebry, a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University and an expert on migrant worker rights, says denying access to reproductive health care goes against international law. It really is uh, not something uh, that uh, should be done in this country. Alberta Health Services spokesperson Carrie Williamson says the health authority is very concerned about this case and is investigating. 
He says all patients should be able to access emergency care, regardless of their ability to pay. Madeline Cummings, CBC News, Edmonton. That is World Report. If you are listening with kids and they have more questions about that European court ruling on climate change, CBC Kids News has some helpful information for the whole family, like what to do if you're feeling eco-anxiety. cbckidsnews.ca. I'm Marcia Young. Thanks for making us part of your day. It is Tuesday, April 9th. I'm Marcy Marcusa, and this is Information Radio. You're on CBC 89.3. Or you might be on the app or on YouTube this morning. This hour on the program, we are going to be uh, hearing about our city's history. The year Winnipeg became a city, it had a handful of clapboard buildings and wood plank sidewalks and flanked mud, flanked right, rather by mud roads. Few buildings reached as high as three stories, leaving a vast horizon. The CBC's Darren Bernhardt recently spent some time digging through the archives to look at pictures of our city's past, and he's going to be here to share a look at how things have changed. So he did a great piece. You can check it out online, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. You can watch on YouTube for some photos, and Darren will be here to walk us through some history. Also, tick season. You heard about it yesterday. We're going to talk about how to protect your pets. So now that the weather's warming up, it is uh, obviously time to remind yourself about that. So a local veterinarian is going to be in to talk about preventing tick-borne diseases in our animals. Heather Walls is here first, though, with other headlines. Good morning. Well, the wife of a Winnipeg man who has been in a Mexican hospital for more than a month is desperate to get him home. Jim Gibbons has been in a hospital in Mazatlan after a scratch on his leg turned into deadly sepsis. His wife says initially their insurance company said he could come home when he was fit to fly. When doctors gave him that all clear, she says Sun Life told her the WRHA said there were no beds. However, the WRHA disputes that saying uh, beds were not a barrier in this case. So we'll hear what happened coming up. As well, the opposition conservatives say the government isn't being transparent about how many new health care workers it's hired. I'll be back with more Manitoba News at 7.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Let's get into what's happening in this weather forecast. Abby, I saw you just pull back the blind in the control room. What are you seeing? Partly cloudy. That's what I see. Like it's just rolling in. You know, that's what we'll be experiencing in these early parts of the morning. Though it's a beautiful start outside. We're currently at uh, two degrees in the city. Now, as we move through August the day. Rivlin is the name? Yeah, as we move through the day, we should be expecting a mix of sun and clouds. Then there's going to be clearing in the skies as we get into the afternoon of periods. And the highs, we're going to be reaching a comfortable uh, 15 degrees later today, making it a very, very wonderful day, in my opinion. Uh, looking ahead, uh, the forecast for today, not really bad. A mix of sun and clouds this morning, then becoming uh, mostly sunny in the afternoon and still above seasonal high. Today, high of 15 in Winnipeg. Tonight, we're going to get to a low of 4. But 15 mostly cloudy is something I'll tell you. Summer is already like uh, in in my rear in view, <laughs> in my rear view mirror, and I can just like it's catching up to me. A mix of sun and clouds for Brandon today. High 15. Thompson today will see a mix of sun and clouds, and a high of 14. Churchill will get to a high of six. Dolphin is headed to a high of 16, and we're anticipating to be in the 20s by the weekend, Mercy. So yeah, no, so, this summer is catching up already. The 20s. 20s. Right. I know. I saw that. Now. <laughs> number on the forecast outlook and I thought wow uh, my husband's golfing he's all excited it's already planned I think he's going to be uh, one of a lot of people out this weekend by the way I apologize I had my mic on I was checking someone's name for an upcoming story so you might have heard me saying that but, Blip. Uh, let's get into what's happening in the morning commute with Corey Funk yeah really straightforward commute so far this morning uh, roads highways bike lanes sidewalks all seem pretty clear uh, even saw a couple of potholes on my way in that are patched uh, so that's kind of exciting to see uh, but if you do see anything going on out there if you want to let me know about it you walk and bike and drive and would love to hear from you that number to call 204-788-3093 
So up first this half hour, as you may have been hearing in the news this morning, nearly 100 years of memories went up in flames yesterday in the Paw. The Lido Theater burnt to the ground. It happened early Monday morning. And decades of memories for former owner August Rivlin went with it. His family opened the theater back in 1930. He spoke to the CBC's Brittany Greenslade. A friend of mine woke me up at 6 a.m. and said the Lido's on fire. What goes through your mind when you get that call? You know what? I think I'm even still in shock. It's just um, the building, although the town of the Paw actually took ownership of it in December with the idea of restoring it, but it was completely full of all my stuff that we were still working on me getting out of there. So there's my stuff, my clothes and things, and four generations of artifacts. Can you tell me a bit about some of those ones that, that mean a lot to you? Um, well, one of the first things I thought of was the uh, the blueprints. I had the original blueprints of the three different stories of the building, and the star. There's a there were stars in the ceiling, so there was a blueprint for how the stars were laid out. And it was always kind of in the in the plan eventually to get them framed and put up somewhere where people could enjoy them. But uh, they are no no longer. So, August, uh, the Lido has been in, was in your family for, for generations. Tell me a little bit about the history of the theater and, and your family's involvement. Yeah, it, uh, my great grandfather was one of the founding partners. There was 11 of them back in 1928 that formed a company and had it built, and it opened in 1930. This, uh, it means a lot to you, I would imagine. Absolutely, yeah. It was, you know, it was kind of home. I, it, it, for me, it probably wasn't just a theater because I grew up in the building. We used to have, uh, my grandmother lived in there and we used to have Christmas dinners in the building. Oh my goodness, that's quite the, that's there, quite the there, history. Yeah, there are apartments in there as well, so that's... I know that a year ago there was a big push because you guys struggled during COVID and there were some renovations and then um, the Lido had been closed for a while. Tell me a little bit about, you know, the past couple of years. Yeah, we were trying to make headway on getting uh, donations and grants, and uh, I don't know, it was just the, I don't know if it was the wrong timing or what the situation was there, but it wasn't going nearly as quickly as possible, or as quickly as we needed it to. Um, and then eventually it just went to uh, tax sale, and the town of the Paw took ownership of it. But their intention was to restore it, which... Out of all the iterations that could have happened, I was most happy with the town of the Paw owning it because I felt like that would be the best way for it to be preserved for another hundred years. What is it like to see this building that meant so much to your family that you lived in that had, you know, all of these really meaningful artifacts to, to just see it gone now? It's devastating. I don't think it's really... I don't know that it's really kicked in yet. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to look at. Did you go down and look at it? Yeah, yeah. I was, I've been around the front and the back kind of off and on all day. Uh, talk, there's many, obviously many members of the community around expressing uh, their sadness as well. And... It's just a shame. What do you think the loss of that building means to the community? I think it, it's the it's the loss of the potential of it. Like the, it was always such a hub of family friendly fun, and one of the few things really in in this in the northern town that is you know family friendly, alcohol free, everyone welcome. And the, I think the fact that that it, it's gone in such a permanent way so quickly will be is a shock to everybody. I know that there's been a number of fires at some some buildings in that town recently over the last few months, a restaurant um, and now the theater and a, and a few other things. Do you know how this, have you been told how this fire started yet? I haven't been told anything. There's been all kinds of rumor. Um, at one point I was, someone said, it, well, it started at the front and and uh, yeah, but it's just speculation. I think they're still investigating. Um, 
August, you said you, you, you essentially grew up in this building. You had Christmas dinners there. Um, is there a memory that really sticks out for you um, that when you think about the Lido? I'd say probably the best memories, and there's so many. Like, there's the first, one of the first pictures of my father holding me is in the basement when I'm six days old. And since my father's been gone for 20 years, I would say any time spent sitting in the office, having a Pepsi and a popcorn talking business, that would probably be one of my tops. A lot of people going down memory lane, uh, including August Rivlin in conversation there uh, with the CBC's Brittany Greenslade. Rivlin's the former owner of the uh, Lido Theatre. As we've been sharing in the news, it burnt to the ground early yesterday morning, and 100 years of memories went up in flames. If you want to read more, if you have a memory to share, uh, you can read on our website, and you can share memories on our listener line, 788-3205. Your neighbourhood. Your community. Your country. Your world. Your news. Your news that matters. News that belongs to you. Your world tonight. Every night, seven days a week on CBC Radio 1. On demand on the CBC Listen app and everywhere you get your podcasts. Well, coming up on the show after 8 o'clock this morning, 529 opened a burger shop recently, a restaurant and cafe at Portage in Maine, just a month ago, an offshoot of their regular restaurant. Now, that was also just before the mayor announced plans to open the intersection of Portage in Maine and potentially close the concourse. The owner says he was surprised by that. We're going to hear some of his concerns moving forward and what the reopening of Portage and Maine is going to mean to now his uh, his businesses that are uh, on that iconic intersection. It is two degrees in Winnipeg. It's calm in the city and a high today of 15 degrees. Well, a bit of music uh, next from a performer who you might have seen last year at Dauphin Country Fest, also was out at uh, St. Madeline Métis Days or the All Folked Up Music Festival at uh, in Winnipeg, uh, Fringe Festival, also played there. Mitchell McCoons was really busy in 2023. He uh, is a roots rock musician. He's actually from Brandon, Manitoba, so he hails from out west and started playing guitar at the age of seven, accompanying his grandfather and his brother, playing Métis fiddle tunes as well. But he's been switching gears lately. He's been working in country music a lot, but this one's a bit more folky, I understand. I haven't heard it yet, so I'll be listening to it first time with you. This is Mitchell McCoons and Changing Man. To frame and love and memory, my lonely loving lying awake, wishing for more time. I pray that this I tear in your eye. Why do the young always gotta die? The memory living on through the loving lands. I like turn it on around. Yeah, you should see. changing man Maybe it's the way I was born and raised Had a real thick skull in my younger days Never thought of much more than getting by Well I've turned all around Yeah you should see me now I quit drinking that Whiskey 
Big finish. That is Brandon's Mitchell McCoons and Changing Man. And uh, I know I described it as a little bit more folk, but I think uh, those uh, country roots are still firmly planted in that track. I enjoyed it. Uh, good wake me up track for a Tuesday morning. A little bit cloudy out there. The puffy kind of uh, cumulus clouds. They look like white cotton balls in the sky. Uh, that's what it's looking like in Winnipeg downtown right now. It's two degrees and it is calm uh, in the city. It's time for morning sports at 725. Scott Regeer joins us. Hello there. Hey there, Marcy. So let's start with basketball and the end of a college career, and no Canadian player has come close to what you're going to talk about before. Yeah, that's right. Uh, fresh off uh, winning back-to-back -back NCAA Player of the Year awards, Marcy, Zach Eady was looking for the cherry on top last night. Uh, but despite his best efforts, 37 points and 10 rebounds, uh, Edie could not get it done. And when I say it, I mean the national championship, of course. Instead, the University of Connecticut won easily, defending the title that they won last season. The seven foot four Edie looked exhausted by the game's end and told reporters he just wants to be remembered uh, for giving everything he has in every game he played. Meanwhile, here's his coach, Matt Painter. People have no idea the burden that you carry when you're as good as he is and you produce like he is going into opposing arenas and the stuff you hear on social media. And he was superior dealing with adversity. And uh, he's going to be a terrific NBA player, and we're really proud of him. I wonder how proud the Raptors are of the Toronto native. Uh, they are projected to have the 17th and 31st overall picks in the upcoming draft, Marcy, either of which could be spots to land Zach Eady. So uh, something to dream on for Canadian basketball fans, perhaps, uh, who will likely see much more of Zach Eady this summer at the Paris Olympics. It was also a busy night in hockey. It was. Uh, both Canadian teams uh, who played in the NHL won uh, Vancouver and Toronto. Uh, meantime, the Jets, they're back in action tonight against the Predators. After snapping their losing streak and securing a playoff berth, the team says they now want to uh, go for home ice advantage in the playoffs. I think winning the Central is probably out of reach at this point. So a second place finish ahead of Colorado, still a distinct possibility. And a win tonight against Nashville would go a long way to that end. Puck drop is at 7 o'clock. Uh, then you have the World Women Women's Championship going on in Utica, New York, Marcy. Uh, Canada taking on their biggest rivals, the States, last night. Just one goal in the game. It came in overtime off the stick of American Kristen Sims. Uh, here is Canadian forward Blair Turnbull. It felt like the intensity level was elevated in that game. The crowd maybe added to it a bit with the USA chance happening the entire 60 minutes. But if you channel it, then I think uh, it can work out great in your favor to try to science them a little bit. U.S. coach John Robluski, who danced wildly on the bench last night after it was done, uh, celebrated the preliminary round win like it was already the champ world championship title game. I think the Canadians are going to remember that, and I think the Canadians will probably run up against the Americans again, and uh, likely in the finals, so we'll see. The Canada-U.S. rivalry is also playing out in soccer uh, on the pitch tonight, right? Yeah, uh, although the Canadian women's team, like everybody else, Marcy, has been fixated on the sky. Don't look at the sun. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Like a tiny little slipper. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So That's it. <laughs> Adriana Leon echoing many people's thoughts yesterday, uh, taking in the eclipse uh, in Columbus, Ohio, where they will face the U.S. tonight in the final of the She Believes Cup. Uh, Columbus just outside the path of totality, but was cloudy yesterday. Tonight's match is likely Canada's last before it defends its Olympic gold in Paris, Marcy. So a positive result would be a very positive thing. And finally, what positives did you take away from the Blue Jays' home opener? Well, they won, which was uh, <laughs> very good, considering uh, Toronto started the season on a long and losing road trip. Uh, and though they've been offensively challenged so far, Marcy, uh, last night every Jay, except George Springer, managed at least one base hit uh, against the Mariners. Uh, pitcher Jose Barrios, he was very good. He uh, shut out Seattle for close to seven innings, and fans were raving about the latest renovations at Skydome, which has put an emphasis on quality over quantity uh, on seats in the lower level. And I will say, as nice as the gray stone motif is compared to the concrete of the past, where was uh, home plate lady? Um, if you follow the Blue Jays on television, you know who I'm talking about. The woman who looks like an Italian Nona with ice water in her veins. Whenever you see a foul ball come screaming behind home plate into the net, she 
barely flinches. Tough as nails, it would seem. <laughs> uh, couldn't see her last night. I was watching with my wife, but then I went online and I checked, and the buzz is, uh, just because of the realignment of the renovations in the seats, she's further over to the right, so you got to uh, keep a closer eye. Don't move don't her know. back. They'll move they her back. They should move her back. Yep, they'll start seeing yeah. the social media buzz. They'll move her back. <laughs> they will. I'll bet they you. will. I'll bet you, you act like this is all about money, Marcy. Come on. <laughs> Sports <laughs> being about money? What? Mm. I know. Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, that is uh, Morning Sports. Scott Regera is going to join us tomorrow once again, as he does every morning. Right now, your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 7.30, it is now 2 degrees in Winnipeg. We start the day with a mix of sun and clouds, and then mostly sunny this afternoon. Today's high is 15. A nearly 100-year-old theater in the Paw has burned to the ground. Fire broke out at the Lido Theater early yesterday. Former owner August Rivelin says a friend called him at 6 in the morning, alerting him about the blaze. Rivelin's family opened that theater back in 1930. He had been working to restore it, but was forced to close when the pandemic hit. The Lido was taken over by the town of the Paw at the end of 2023 with plans for a revitalization project. Rivelin says losing the theater is going to have a big impact on the community. It was always such a hub of family-friendly fun, and one of the few things really in, in this in the northern town that is, you know, family-friendly, alcohol-free, everyone welcome. Yeah, I think the fact that, that it's gone in such a permanent way so quickly is a shock to everybody. Rivelin says the fire also destroyed decades of historical artifacts, memorabilia, and documents that were still inside the building. A third person hurt when the Fort Gibraltar footbridge collapsed last year is suing Festival de Voyageur and the city of Winnipeg. On May 31st last year, a group of students was touring the historic site when the wooden footbridge crashed to the ground. 17 children and one adult were injured. In this latest case, the complainant says she fell six meters and suffered numerous permanent injuries. Court documents say she suffered a fractured spine, injuries to the neck and foot. It also says the incident caused her psychological damage. She is suing general damages for loss of ability to earn an income and medical expenses. Two other lawsuits on behalf of children who were injured have also been filed. The wife of a Winnipeg man who's been in a Mexican hospital for more than a month is desperately trying to get him home. Jim Gibbons has been in a hospital in Mazatlan after a scratch turned into deadly sepsis. His wife, Stacy Conway, says their insurance company initially said he could come home when he was fit to fly. When doctors gave him the all clear, Conway says Sun Life told her the WRHA said there were no beds. Now, Conway says flights arranged by the insurance company for him to come home have been cancelled. She says all the people who traveled to Mazatlan to view yesterday's eclipse are taking up the flights. There are millions of people there right now, and they're all going to be trying to get home tomorrow and this week. There's no flights for him. In a statement, Sun Life says when it's arranging to send a patient back to Canada, a hospital bed must be available. The WRHA tells CBC a lack of beds was not a barrier in Gibbon's case. The opposition Conservatives say the government isn't being transparent about how many new health care workers it has hired. The NDP won't reveal how many health care workers have been hired since it took power six months ago. The government has announced more hospital beds and facilities in the last few days, but Tory health critic Kathleen Cook worries they're not being staffed by new workers. The fact that the minister wasn't willing to answer that question in question period concerns me that these are not net new positions, that these might be staff coming from other areas of the health care system. Cook says the government also promised to update wait times for patients. She says the latest online data is from January. Well, a day before Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is due to appear before the public inquiry into foreign interference in Canada's elections, the panel will hear today from Katie Telford. She is the Prime Minister's chief of staff. Her testimony comes a day after the inquiry saw a briefing document prepared for the Prime Minister's office by Canada spy agency. It stated China meddled in both the 2019 and 2021 federal election campaigns.
The European Court of Human Rights has ruled in favor of a group of Swiss women who say the Swiss government isn't doing enough to protect them from climate change. C'est la politique qui doit changer. C'est les politiciens qui faut changer. A member of the Senior Women for Climate Protection, they went before the court arguing they are increasingly at risk of death due to heat waves and other extreme weather events. The court agrees, ruling the EU nations have an obligation to protect their citizens from the effects of climate change. You can hear more national and international news coming up on World Report at 8. And Manitoba's advanced education and training minister says Ottawa's international student cap for post-secondary institutions has hurt this province. Manitoba's projected to see a 9% drop in the number of international students it can accept under the change. Renee Cable calls that cap disappointing. It's unfortunate that we in some ways were a bit of collateral damage in the federal government using a very blunt tool to apply a policy nationwide where we really didn't have the same sort of circumstances in every province. Cable says the province will continue working with its post-secondary schools and the federal government. You can find more news updated throughout the day at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Well, we've been practicing our old-timey voices. We have a history item coming up. So Corey's pretty good at this. Yeah, the year is 1847. That's not bad. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know why you did them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. What is, why. They always did sound like they were kind of going, eh. I don't know why. <laughs> don't Winnipeg know. marks its 150th anniversary as a city this year. Ah. I'm not very good. <laughs> Forgot them, yeah. <laughs> I did forget that noise, yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about that, though, in a second. We promise the item will be better than uh, what we're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> with our intonation. Uh, Abby's looking at us like, I'm not even trying this. Right now, the weather oh. feels like... Oh, not bad, not bad. We're all getting in it on Sounds more it. like not a bad. UFC sort of <laughs> announcer or something. I don't know. <laughs> Coming in the ring now. Actually, that's kind of true, yeah. All right, let's uh, settle down here. Settle down, Tuesday morning. Uh, what does the weather feel like? Uh, it's currently two degrees outside. I don't know what it looks like. Fluffy white cotton balls in the sky. That's what I'll tell you. Mercy already told you. It's, it's actually called a cumulus cloud, but it looks fluffy out there. Today's forecast actually brings a mix of sun and clouds across the province with temperatures going to be reaching highs of 16. But in Winnipeg, we're getting to a high of 15. Brandon is currently at minus 2 with partly cloudy skies. We will see a transition of sun and clouds later on for folks in Brandon. And then if we head north to Thompson, it's currently 2 degrees, mostly cloudy up there, and a high of 14 is in the forecast. Churchill is currently at minus two. Lots of cloud covering we see there and that's what it's going to look like throughout the day reaching a high of six. Dauphin is currently clear at zero a high of 16. Gimli's at two on the partly cloudy skies expecting a high of 12. Steinbeck is sitting at one degree right now with partly cloudy skies. It's clearing up in the afternoon period and then we will see a high of 16. Morris is also going to be racing to a high of 16 later in the day but currently it's partly cloudy at minus two overall. We're expecting a mixed bag of uh, weather today, starting off with cloudy periods in some areas and then a transition to some sunshine later. And then some regions will definitely be seeing that dance between the sun and the cloud. But in Winnipeg, we are heading to a high of 15. All right. Thank you, Abby. You're welcome. Uh, Corey, the commute's kind of quiet? Yeah, really quiet so far. Haven't heard anything uh, on the commuter line. Pretty nice commute in. I do want to hear if you want to give me a call if you've pulled out maybe your electric scooter for the first time or your rollerblades. Give me a call on the commuter line. Tell me how you're getting to, to work or school or whatever today and how you're feeling about uh, maybe taking uh, that new mode of transportation that's been collecting dust in your basement the past few months. Give me a call, 204-788-3093. So in a moment, we are going to get to this uh, lovely historical piece about our city of Winnipeg Man. with uh, Darren Bernard. <laughs> But we've been doing the old timey voices. It reminds me of uh, uh, we were playing a game once where you uh, almost like a charades. You had to describe or act out the person. Yeah. So my sister was trying to do something from the 1960s. So not really way back like 1900, but yet she was sort of trying to sort of <laughs> bring like that. forward that more you know old timey voice. But yeah. all she managed to do was stand in front of us and put her hand on her hip and look at us and go. It <laughs> 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 scream 60s. It scream 60s. To me. <laughs> and, then we're, and then she made a motion like she was smoking a cigar. <laughs> and we're like, what are you doing? And then finally she goes, grassy knoll. Wah, wah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, are you doing something about Kennedy? What are you doing? Oh, it was terrible. Oh, 
Yeah, I love that. Uh, we're going to drop all the accents and get into the facts and the photos because that's really at the heart of our next story. And please, if you're on YouTube, check us out while we're having our interview here. But also, please uh, go on our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba, and uh, look along at the photos we're going to be describing. This is all about Winnipeg marking its 150th anniversary as a city this year. So when the Manitoba legislature passed the act that officially made Winnipeg a city on November 8th, 1873, there were 1,800 169 residents. In three decades, we went, our city, from an isolated frontier upstart to what would become the third largest city in Canada at the time. CBC reporter Darren Bernhardt joins us to talk about how the city has changed. Good morning. Good morning, Mars. I love historical pieces. I'm so glad for this one. Now, you were in your happy place, too, I understand, going through a lot of old photos, right? Uh, oh, what what you find? So, so so much my happy place. Right now is my happy place because I'm listening to you guys. I have to say, I was I was practicing this voice the other day, going just old CBC style. This is Darren Bernhardt. <laughs> that's my. That's why it's going to take us an hour to get through the report yeah. if we go back to the old school pacing. Anyway, yes, yes. I was. I love looking at old photos. I love looking at old photos. I, I do it all the time. And I, what I love to do is try to imagine those places as as they are now. So that's what I did with uh, with CBC videographer Trevor Bryan. I found a bunch of images from the time Winnipeg's birth, and uh, we printed them off, and we headed to the same locations to recreate them. That's and, so cool. And, yeah. And what we found was, uh, as expected, a, a drastic difference. I think um, the change is best described by historian Gordon Goldsboro, who we met up with on Main Street, between two spots cited as the birthplaces of Winnipeg, Upper Fort Garry and the corner of Portage Maine. Have a listen. Well, I think if you could somehow bring somebody back from that time period to now and standing on this spot, nothing about this view would be the same. You know, they would be amazed at all the utility poles and the pavement and the sidewalks and the tall buildings. Everything would have looked different. So you've handed me some photos here uh, for that, that people can see online here, right? Goldsboro talking about how everything has changed. Wow, is it ever apparent when you look at these? We do still have old buildings in the city, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. We, I mean, there are pockets of historical buildings throughout downtown and in many of the suburbs, like a lot of these neighborhoods, the Kelonians are, are very old. Um, but they don't date back to those first days. You know, here, I'll let uh, Goldsboro explain that as well. Most of it is from a later period. There are very few buildings left from the 1870s. Most of the buildings in the Exchange District, we always look at that as sort of the most historic part of the city, and most of it is they dating from the 1880s and onward. Is is there anything left from Winnipeg's earliest days as a city? Because even for myself, and I thought I have seen a lot of historical photos, these ones you've pulled with like the really, like just, it looks like, it looks like a saloon street in an old western <laughs> that does. you might see somewhere on Netflix, right? I've never seen photos of Winnipeg like this. Is there anything left? And that one you're holding, that's Portage and Maine. This is? That's Portage wow. and Maine. Yeah, just on the, uh, to the right there would be uh, where the Bank of Montreal stands. Look at the covered wagon. There's a covered right? wagon in this photo. Yeah, covered yeah. wagon. Yeah, wood spoke, uh, wood spoke wheels on it. Yeah. Um, what is left there? Yeah, honestly, not much. Um the only remnant really is the Upper Fort Garry Gate near Main and Broadway. Uh, back in 1874, the Hudson's Bay Fort, you know, it was massive, right? It was 2,000 square foot structure and it went extended right across Main Street. But it became a casualty of the growing city and was gradually demolished between 1881 and 1888. Um, you know, to give you an example of how quickly the city grew, it was just five square kilometers in 1873 when we became a city and had, as you mentioned, just over 1,800 people. Within a year, there were 3,700 people, and by 1911, it was the third largest city in Canada with a population of 136,000. Uh, today, there are almost 800,000 people, and the city covers 462 square kilometers. It was five square kilometers at that time. Um, and another major change I want to mention is traffic. Back in the 1870s, as the picture you were just looking at, congestion would have been a few wagons on the streets. Today, there are over 600,000 vehicles registered in Winnipeg, um, and, and even then, even despite the, the few tr bit of traffic back in cities, the city's early days, there still would have been some road noise thanks to Red River carts. Uh, here's Goldsboro again. Oh, heck yeah. They didn't use any grease in the bearings, and so there would have been this loud screeching noise as they went down the street. But that would be about it. It would have been a much quieter place than it is today. I know we pulled some of that sound when we were doing this stuff around the 100th anniversary of the uh, general strike in Winnipeg. Yeah. And he's right. It was surprising how noisy some of that all was uh, on the streets. Now, you actually hit the street to sort of 
show some of these photos uh, to Winnipeggers. Is that right? We did. We did. What did people say? Uh, it was really interesting to see the reactions. So they'd look at these photos, then look up again to see what the viewers, and then look back at the photos. And, you know, they were, their reactions were, were, so, uh, were so wild. Like, all of them were just gasping. But uh, so one of the people we spoke to is Katie Desolé. Uh, we met up with her on Main Street near City Hall and showed her an 1875 photo taken from the same spot, kind of looking towards uh, Bannatyne. Here's her response. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that unreal? When was this? 18, 1875. That's 1875. I have wow. pictures from 1874 showed the exact same thing. Oh, but... my gosh. That's so cool. It looks like almost residential. Wow. How enlightening. So where did you find all the photos? Well, I always I always dig up in Manitoba archives. Fantastic stuff there. But these ones, the city, I have to give kudos to the city of Winnipeg. They have put together some amazing um, anniversary features on their website. So the City of Winnipeg archives, their um, Winnipeg in Focus, they've they've pulled together a lot of the photos. They have such great information, even documents and reports and different things. So if, if somebody can get a chance, uh, Google the City of Winnipeg archives or Winnipeg in Focus. There's a lot of great stuff right there. I, I'm obsessed because I live in a house that is 1910. So I'm, I was uh, the first house on my street. I'm not going to identify where I live publicly here. But uh, so I always look at archives to try to see if I can, you know, what images will be there of my street and I, I'd love to do a feature on the oldest house you know on your street so if you're that, listening this morning I mean uh, honestly we will we will get on that right away I promise you if I don't do it or Darren doesn't do it we'll do it together so call us 788-3205 and we can keep the historical discussions going um, I do have to ask you a question before you go yeah. though, about math because Winnipeg <laughs> became a city in November 1873 um, why are we celebrating our 150th anniversary this year in 2024? The math doesn't work. Yeah, no, that's a really good question and one that comes up a lot. It's because the the first civic election, which you know established the inaugural city council, didn't happen until January 5th, 1874. And that new council met later that same month. So the city formally commemorates that as its start. 1873 was when it was inaugurated, or uh, uh, but but 1874 is really when things began. Uh, thank you for coming in. I know that your online piece has created a lot of buzz, a lot of people checking it out, and more will be now. So appreciate you coming in. Yeah, thanks, Marcy. That is the CBC's Darren Bernhardt reporter here uh, with us. If you want to see uh, some of the photos that we've been talking about and trying to describe here, uh, you really just got to go and check them out online. And you'll also see comparisons to some of the same views today, which is cool. So cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Hi, I'm Leah. And I'm Phelan. We're the hosts of the Irreverent History Podcast, The Secret Life of Canada. We've covered everything from the history behind the iconic bay blanket to why blackface is still a thing and how all our histories can be traced back to our relationship with water. Oh, you forgot about the controversial debate over which dessert is the most Canadian, the butter tart or the Nanaimo bar? Yes, I did forget that. That was intense. The Secret Life of Canada. Available now on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. It is 12 minutes to 8 o'clock on CBC. I'm R.C. Marcusa. Thanks so much for joining us here on the show. You're on 89.3 FM, 990 AM on the app or YouTube. Partly cloudy, as we've been sharing with you, it's 2 degrees. We do have those puffy white clouds that are kind of coming and going downtown. And uh, today we'll have a high of 15 before it clears tonight, early evening. Overnight, 30% chance of some showers. Uh, pardon me, tomorrow morning, 30% chance of some showers after a cloudy overnight. Tomorrow's high is 15 as well. And then as we uh, inch toward the weekend here, we're going to see some sunshine for the weekend. We could see a Saturday high of 22. So I know that uh, some golf courses have already started to open. Kildonan Park, for example, I believe is going to open this week in one of the city courses if you're looking to get out and about. Well, next on the show, with the weather warming up, there is a concern. Um, the sidewalks and parks are almost all snow-free, so a lot of people are going to get out there and explore what nature has to offer. And then if you have them, you're going to take your pets. But with early warm weather, as we was, were reporting yesterday in the news, can come early tick season. So the bloodsuckers carry diseases, like Lyme disease. It can cause a lot of harm to your furry friends. And to talk about the latest information and protection, Dr. Jonas Watson's in studio. He's a veterinarian over at the Grand Park Animal Hospital. Good morning. Good morning, Marcy. So early tick season, do you remember talking about, you know, having this conversation this early in, in the year? It's early, but there's been a trend towards these uh, earlier tick seasons over the last 10 or so years. We've you know, we used to talk about heartworm season, which was spread by mosquitoes, and that was the only medication we would be prescribing to dogs is June to November to protect against heartworm season. Now we have drugs for 
for tick prevention. And so we are starting those earlier and earlier every year, it seems. Um, and what are the drugs for tick prevention? Is it a shot? Is it an oral medication? Is they're, it administered once? Or what's the deal with them? Yeah, they're monthly. They tend to be monthly products for the most part. They're chewable things. They're sort of very similar to the heartworm meds that um, pet owners are accustomed to. Flavored little chews. There are some products that are topical, especially the ones for cats tend to be topical. So there are a variety of different products made by a variety of different manufacturers out there now. Um, what if someone says, I don't have to worry, I just walk my dog in the city, whatever? Yeah, there are certainly some dogs, you know, that little Pomeranian that lives in a high-rise apartment may not have that much tick exposure, but ticks are around everywhere. There are obviously parts of the province and city that are where dogs would be more uh, prone to picking up ticks, but, um, you know, ticks can latch onto squirrels and deer and, and birds and fall off into even well-manicured lawns. So I think everybody has to be cognizant of the fact that ticks are out there and kind of no matter where you go. I'm surprised you said cats. But, I mean, some people have cats, even yeah. though, you know, that, that just do happen to be roaming around right yeah, outside. Yeah, I mean, cats are pretty fastidious groomers, so they don't tend to let things get on them and stay on them too long. But certainly cats can get ticks, especially cats who are outside a lot. And the other thing that we worry about in cats are, are, are potentially fleas, which they might catch from wildlife. These products that are available now tend to kill not just ticks, but also um mites and lice and fleas and other ectoparasites. What are the uh, diseases? I mentioned Lyme, um, but if we can elaborate, what are we worried about uh, with having a tick on our animal? Yeah, there are a handful. Lyme would be one of them. Anaplasma, Ehrlichia are the others that we regularly screen for, but Lyme would be one of the main ones that we're kind of watching for, and it can cause a variety of different signs in clinically affected dogs. Most dogs that are exposed to positive, like Lyme positive ticks don't actually come down with illness. Like a great majority don't actually, come, they mount an immune response but never actually get sick. But of the ones that do get sick, they can get quite sick. Um, they can get polyarthropathies, multi-joint lameness, malaise, fever, and even serious kidney disease. So that's why obviously the prevention is something people talk about. Yeah, we kind of want to tr prevent if we can. There are also vaccines for Lyme disease too that are available and those um, can be very effective in the pre uh, prevention prevention of Lyme disease too. Are there areas of the province that you notice that uh, there's uh, more concern? Like if somebody doesn't have the Pomeranian in the high rise, yeah. let's go to the opposite. Somebody's hiking every weekend with their dog through some areas of the yeah, province. Yeah, it's all about exposure like that. So if you're walking along the river, if you're walking in a Cinnaboyne forest, if you are if you live outside of the city and the dogs are sort of outside in rural Manitoba uh, on farms and that kind of thing, those animals would certainly be at greater risk than ones in the city. But, but, but even the ones in the city are still potentially at risk depending on their lifestyle. What's the uh, cost range of tick prevention products? It's expensive. It's it's not it's not cheap. I mean, it's uh, especially for big dogs, and if you have multiple dogs, it, it can be expensive. But um, you know, um, it, it it can prevent the need for uh, having to do other tests and repeated medications, depending on whether your pet gets sick. So. We tend to think that it's worthwhile. I mean, these preventive medications can sometimes save your pet's life. Is it like a hundred bucks a shot? Like, what, uh, are, or what are we looking it's at? It's very dependent on on weight, but uh, certainly like a big dog who's getting a full season's worth, which might be eight doses, because we're talking April to November. Yeah, you could be in it for a couple hundred bucks. Got it. Yeah. Um, I said a shot, but I should be clear here. You said there's various ways of administering it, and that's probably the least common way. It's going to be a pill or a gummy, as you said. I yeah, think, right? for the most part, it's these little chewable beef flavored treats that we're using monthly. Um, there are some topical things that get squirted on the skin between the shoulder blades. Yep. There are still some there are still some injections that are that are used, but they're less common now than they used to be. What if uh, what if you uh, what symptoms should you be looking for uh, in a pet that's not protected? And if you know when should you worry? Yeah, I think that if you first of all if you find a tick on um, your pet on your dog or cat, you should try to identify it perhaps by going on the internet or perhaps by bringing it into the vet. Um, but if your dog is showing signs of just general illness, like if we're talking about Lyme disease, we're talking about lethargy, we're talking about a fever, we're talking about being down off of food, perhaps changes in water consumption and urination and mobility issues. Um, in terms of how to get the pill into the dog, <laughs> yeah, let's have that conversation yeah. because even dog owners who think, you know, no problem, it's going to be good, I'm going to do the peanut butter thing and it doesn't work, some animals... Just yeah, spit it out. That's true. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks for that? Well, any kind of medication? Yeah. A, you know, a client of mine a little bit ago showed me the way that she gets her dog's heart medication into the dog. And she takes a hot dog and she cuts it up. She sort of cuts it in half, puts the thing inside and kind of creates her own little 
pill pocket that way. The dog's very excited to take a hot, to have a piece of hot dog every day. That seems to work quite well. There are a variety of other products, including pill pockets and, and other things you can buy from pet stores and stuff. But um, fortunately, these medications we're talking about, they are flavored. So the great majority of animals like taking them because they taste like beef, and so they, they like it. There will always be those finicky dogs. But um, you just have to get creative with them. Who was your most stubborn dog over the years? Did you have, even as a vet, I'm guessing you must have had some tough customers that just are like, no, you're not getting me, Dr. Watson. Yeah, there are, s- there are some. I mean, some of them will go for it for the first few doses, and then they're kind of like, eh, I see what's happening here. I'm not going to go for that. That's where a good piece of, you know, like processed cheese or something or something tasty you can wrap it wrap it up and we'll we'll, we'll hopefully get you a few more doses in cheese always works cheese somehow, always right works. Yeah. yeah have yeah. you seen cheese tax on tiktok che- on tiktok uh, no i have not oh i gotta send you that it's hilarious <laughs> it's a bunch of dogs and it's this song about you know you must pay the cheese tax uh, and they're all singing if you're eating cheese you have to give your dog cheese well that seems very reasonable to <laughs> me <laughs> As long as you don't give them too much. Uh, You mentioned if someone finds a tick on their pet, uh, they should be, you know, vigilant about that. Do you remove it the same way? Not to get into too much detail, but is it the same as removing it off a human? Yeah, sometimes people have a tendency, pet owners have a tendency to try to get very creative about the way they remove these ticks. They'll stick a pin in it, they'll light it on fire, or they'll do these wild things. At the veterinary office, we just grab it firmly with our fingers, maybe with a piece of Kleenex, get the whole thing in our hands, and just yank it forcefully off. And if you do that, you're likely to get all the parts of the tick. It is not actually that common to leave behind the head or mouth parts. If you do see a little bite reaction afterwards, that's usually just an inflammatory reaction. That's just the bite itself. That does not mean that there are parts of the tick left in the dog. You must get some crazy calls to the vet, I bet. Oh, we get crazy calls. I mean, the, the, at this time of year, we'll have people bringing the dog in for a tick, and then we have a look at the dog, and it's just the dog's nipple. And then you have to explain to the owner that the dog has nipples, and that can go <laughs> down a real rabbit hole. And I'm not judging anyone, listeners, because I'm one of those people. My dog once ate a hazelnut, and I was, like, freaking out. Right. I went down the Google rabbit hole, and I'm like, that's it. Right. It's over. Right, right. This hazelnut's the end of the animal. Right. So, Well, we definitely advise that owners not yank their dogs by the nipples, uh, if possible. It's just sort of in the dog's best interest to not do that. Uh, nice to see you. Just last quick question about the tick uh, matters. Back to serious things here for a moment. Uh, how long is the season? Like, how long should people worry? Is it ever too late if your dog's been exposed and you want to, back, you know, start feeding them the gummies later, the medication? It's n- it's never too late. Uh, this is the month, I think, though. Like, perhaps March was the month, but certainly this is the month. I mean, we're going to go up into the teens today for, for the uh, temperatures. So, like, this is the time to get started. And, and so we're usually selling a, a total of eight tablets or, or eight chewies, um, uh, for April to November right now. So so get your dog into the vet and get those meds to start for the season now. Thanks for coming in. I'll send you cheese tax later. Okay, thanks, Marcy. You'll like it. Uh, Dr. Jonas Watson, veterinarian at Grant Park Animal Hospital. Right now, it is uh, coming up to exactly three minutes to 8 a.m. on your Tuesday morning, April the 9th, and Heather Wells is in with our morning headlines. Good morning. Well, a third person hurt when the Fort Gibraltar footbridge collapsed last year is now suing Festival de Voyageur and the city of Winnipeg. Last May, a group of students was touring the historic site when the wooden footbridge crashed to the ground. 17 children and one adult were injured. In this latest case, the complainant says she fell six meters and suffered numerous permanent injuries. The wife of a Winnipeg man who has been in a Mexican hospital for more than a month is desperate to get him home. Jim Gibbons has been in hospital in Mazatlan after a scratch turned into deadly sepsis. His wife says initially their insurance company said he could come home when he was fit to fly. When doctors gave him the all clear, she says Sun Life told her the WRHA said there were no beds. But the WRHA tells CBC a lack of beds was not a barrier. We'll hear the story in our next local news at 8.30. All right. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. So you might be having a great morning walk out there this morning, or maybe you're on your bike. Uh, Good weather for it. Two degrees. It's calm. It's partly cloudy. And for the day, a mix of sun and cloud and a high of 15. If you do have anything to add to the commute, uh, we've had a pretty good one. 788-3093 is where you can update us if we're missing any problem out there. Well, coming up on the program after 8 o'clock, the iconic 529 opened its doors with some new restaurants and offerings at Portage in Maine. Now, that's just before the mayor announced plans to open the intersection and close the concourse. The owner says he was surprised. We're going to hear more about him, about that rather, from him after 8 o'clock on the program. And we'll find out how the uh, closing of Portage, pardon me, reopening of Portage in Maine is uh, going to affect his businesses and the closing of the concourse. So stay tuned. That's all still ahead. I'm Marcy Marcusa. World Report, though, is next right here on CBC. So stay with us. You're on 
today on Q with Tom Power. Synesthesia is the crossing of senses, like seeing color when you hear sound or even tasting sound. Rudy Mancuso talks to Talia Schlanger about how he turned his own daily experience with synesthesia into his first feature film which sounds kind of cool and different and romantic, but it can also be quite torturous and distracting and unnerving. That's coming up on Q, followed by Commotion with Elamine abdel Mahmoud on CBC Radio 1, the CBC Listen app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. The CBC News is next. Coming up in half an hour, it's The Current with Matt Galloway. Almost 7 million Canadians don't have a family doctor. Former Federal Health Minister Jane Philpott says that fixing that is easy and that it won't break the bank. Her prescription for fixing health care in Canada coming up on The Current. This is World Report. This is... Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. A top European court has ruled that inaction against climate change can amount to a violation of basic rights. In a landmark verdict for climate change campaigners, the European Court of Human Rights upheld a petition by 2,000 senior Swiss women. The court dismissed two other similar lawsuits, but campaigners are calling it a collective victory. Freelance journalist Ishan Garg has more. I am so, well, shocked, positively shocked. So that is Swinette so Belka, one of the 2,000 women dubbed as climate grannies who filed the lawsuit. The court has ruled in their favor. It said Switzerland's inaction against climate change has violated the women's right to a good quality of life. It also criticized the Swiss government for failing to hit its greenhouse emission reduction targets. This is the first time an international court has considered poor climate policies akin to a violation of human rights. The court dismissed two other similar cases on the same day. Sofia Oliveira is one of the six Portuguese youth who brought a suit against 32 European nations. Despite their case being dismissed, Oliveira is happy some progress has been made. The most important thing is that the court has said the Swiss women's case that governments must cut their emissions more to protect the human rights. So I really think their win is a win for us too and a win for everyone. This verdict opens up the possibility of citizens suing their national governments for not following up on their climate pledges. Campaigners say this is the biggest development since the signing of the Paris Accords when world leaders agreed to cap the rise in average global temperatures well below 2 degrees. Ishan Gerg for CBC News, Brussels. This morning at The Hague, Germany is defending its decision to send weapons to Israel and cancel funding to the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency. Germany is doing its utmost to live up to its responsibility vis-à-vis both the Israeli and the Palestinian people. Our history is the reason why Israel's security has been at the core of German foreign policy. Nicaragua brought Germany before the International Court of Justice, accusing it of facilitating genocide. But lawyers for Germany are arguing that is a one-sided view of the issue. As a matter of fact, only four war weapons have been licensed for export since October 2023, three of which concern test or practice equipment. The minute we look closely, Nicaragua's accusations fall apart. The World Court has not yet ruled on a case accusing Israel of committing genocide in Gaza. Israel denies the charge. The public inquiry into foreign interference is narrowing in on what government officials knew about foreign meddling in the last two elections and what they intentionally kept quiet. Today, we will hear from the senior staff who were supporting the Liberal government, including some of the Prime Minister's close advisors. Janice McGregor is watching the inquiry in Ottawa and paying close attention to the details. Janice, where is the paper trail taking us now? Marcia, the deeper we get into the evidence, the more it appears that when the leaks about foreign election meddling hit the news, it shouldn't have been news to those at the centre of Justin Trudeau's government. Yesterday, the inquiry got specific briefing materials prepared by CSIS for the Prime Minister himself. Heavily redacted, yes. But even what was left suggested specific intelligence on interference by the People's Republic of China in both the 2019 and the 2021 elections. Serious enough that CSIS brought in senior players in the Liberal campaign to brief them about this intelligence in the middle of the election. Even during the caretaker period, security officials brought in Justin Trudeau to be briefed as Liberal leader. 
Nathalie Durant, who's now Trudeau's national security advisor, but during these elections was on the panel of senior bureaucrats in charge of sounding the alarm to the public if a serious threat emerged. She told the inquiry that the panel thought sharing their intelligence about what happened at the nomination meeting in the Toronto riding of Don Valley North was a way to mitigate the threat in 2019, even though it didn't stop Han Dong from becoming an MP. It is not the role of the panel to give advice to any parties in terms of who can be a candidate or not. Yes. Um, so you didn't put two and two together after the election? No. This inquiry is grappling with to what extent sunshine can be the best disinfectant, even as it probes whether Trudeau's government should be saying more about what it knows. It is increasingly clear it sure knew more than what it said at the time. Thank you, Janice. You're welcome. The CBC's Janice McGregor in Ottawa. The man who murdered four members of a Muslim family in London, Ontario, is seeking to appeal his convictions. In February, Nathaniel Veltman was found guilty of four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. The judge ruled he committed an act of terrorism when he drove his truck into the Afzal family in 2021. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. CBC News has found that a Toronto lab that sold a common prenatal paternity test had a pattern of identifying the wrong dads. The test matches fetal DNA in the mother's blood with a father. As Jorge Barrera reports, former employees are speaking out about what they saw happen inside the lab. Yeah, it's like as soon as I saw those test results, immediately right then and there, things just changed. My Before the changed. baby was even born, John Brennan was told by Viagard Acumetrics in 2015 that he was the father. But less than a year later, the Atlanta, Georgia resident found out the lab test was wrong. And so you're left in this mysterious, dark place mentally. And Brennan was not alone. A CBC News investigation has found Viagard Acumetrics had a 10-year history of IDing wrong dads across Canada, the U.S. and overseas. Um, people were also very scared to call because they, they used to get told off. Sika Risho worked less than three months for the lab handling customer inquiries. Sometimes I would say I sent two tests in and I got different results. That happened as well, yes. That happened a lot. They said I did it twice because I wanted to be sure. She alleges employees were coached to ask women about their menstrual cycles, information DNA tests don't need. Then lab owner Harvey Tenenbaum would sometimes look over results and make guesses at paternity. He would always make a comment like, oh, well, it's definitely this one. It's this, it's this one. It's this one. It's got to be this one. She doesn't know if those are the results customers received. Tenenbaum ignored multiple CBC requests for interviews, but when approached outside his lab, Dr. Harvey Tenenbaum, hey. he said mistakes happen. Well, you know, you do tests? thousands of tests, and half the errors are the collection problem. Vigard stopped doing prenatal paternity tests in 2021, but it's still in the business of testing babies after they're born. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Ottawa. It is a sort of homecoming for two Russian acrobats who defected to Canada in 1992. They fled the Moscow Circus. The couple vaulted into a new life in Newfoundland, then started performing across North America. Now they're back in St. John's to thank the women who helped them start over. Mark Quinn has the story. Three decades ago, seven Russians found safe haven in St. John's. They were returning from a performance in South America and made their daring move to defect as their plane refueled in Gander. Alex Arestov was one of the seven. He says it was frightening. I knew just two words, hi and goodbye. <laughs> so... They were highly trained acrobats, schooled at the Moscow Circus, and they needed a place to keep up their skills. Arestov said when they found the Cygnus Gymnastics Club in St. John's, it was a perfect fit. You know, a miracle. It's, wow, we find a place, maybe we can practice here. Judy Tulk was the club's manager. She helped the Russians continue to train, work and navigate immigration. The Arestovs have flourished. Now in their 60s, husband and wife Alex and Elena continue to tour North America, performing together. Alex said they had to take a break and return to St. John's to thank Tulk and celebrate her 80th birthday. She's like my mom. She do everything, and uh, she took my hand and 
first step in Canada. Talk says she's received much more than she's given. I don't know, it's just utter happiness. There's dozens of people who would have done the same thing. It was actually an experience and a joy. The arrest offs promise they'll be back for Talk's 90th and 100th birthdays too. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. That is World Report. If you're listening with kids and they have more questions about the European court ruling on climate change, CBC Kids News has some helpful information for the whole family, like what to do if you're feeling eco-anxiety. It's all on our website, cbckidsnews.ca. I'm Marcia Young. Good morning, Manitoba. I'm Marcy Marcusa. Thanks for joining us on Information Radio here on CBC, 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or YouTube. Partly cloudy sky out there in downtown Winnipeg. Well, speaking of downtown, 529, the restaurant, recently opened a couple of other restaurants, a burger shop, a cafe at Portage in Maine. Now, a month ago, they did this, just before the mayor announced plans to open the intersection and potentially close the concourse. The owner says he was surprised. We hear some of his concerns and also how he thinks that reopening Port of Germain is going to impact his businesses. So stay tuned for that. Also, before uh, 8 o'clock on the show, we were having a discussion about the importance of uh, knowing what the risk is to your pets. Now the tick season is upon us and it's early this year. But we got into a conversation about how to get the medication in your pet's mouth. So we're going to have a little fun with that. First, though, here's Heather Wells with our news headlines. Good morning. Well, a nearly 100-year-old theater in the Paw has burned to the ground. Fire broke out at the Lido Theater early yesterday. The former owner, August Rivelin, says losing the theater is going to have a big impact on the community. And the opposition conservatives say the government is not being transparent about how many new health care workers it's hired. The NDP government has announced more hospital beds and facilities over the last few days. But Tory health critic Kathleen Cook worries they're not being staffed by new workers. We'll hear more in our next local news at 830. Let's get into what's going on uh, in the uh, weather and uh, traffic situation here in the city of Winnipeg. Uh, Abby's been uh, kind of opening and closing the blinds all morning, keeping an eye on the sky. Hi, Abby. Hi, Marcy. It's still fluffy outside. But uh, not to worry, we're expecting a mix of sun and cloud today. Looking at the forecast for today, not bad, nothing to complain about. Cloudy start as we've been seeing and then things will be clearing up as we get closer to the launch period. Then we would see that mix of sun and cloud roll in and much closer to the launch period, it will be sunny. It's shaping up to be quite another pleasant one out there. We're above seasonal. Today we're going to be reaching a high of 15 in Winnipeg and then some clouds overnight and the skies will remain clear but that and the clouds will roll in after midnight and we're anticipating for tomorrow mainly cloudy skies and a chance of showers in the afternoon for brandon it's currently sunny and cloudy uh, at minus one thompson is at zero we will see a mix of sun and clouds there churchill at minus three dauphin is at two gimli at three steinbeck and morris both at one degrees yesterday at this time uh, we were talking actually to Lori M- miller and ron mark mm-hmm. and uh, they were chatting with us from Mazatlan. So they were there to see the uh, total eclipse, which was amazing. And she actually sent a bit of an update photo. It's up on YouTube now. It's uh, her and Mark and their glasses looking up and she writes, Buenos dias. My eclipse pictures aren't that great. There's so many more out there that are beautiful. She writes, the experience was way beyond the what I expected. Strong emotions, she said, and some tears surprised me. There were a lot of people like that yesterday. Lori wrote, stunningly beautiful from start to finish, and now I understand why people chase the eclipse, eclipses all over the world. It was fun wandering around afterwards and talking with people, friends, and strangers to hear about their various experiences. So mm-hmm. just wanted to share that update with the listeners. People heard uh, Lori and Mark as they were getting ready for the day, uh, and Ron, rather, as they were getting ready for the day, and the, uh, the um, crowds were gathering gathering on the beach. It's I amazing. think I think solar eclipse tourism should be a thing. Oh, for sure. It should be a thing, you know, just it chase thing, the solar actually. eclipse and then just check into places. And I know there's a town somewhere in the United States, I can't remember where, it's totally dark out at night because it's a, it's a, night, it's a town for uh, sky watches. So they, if you check into that small town for the tourism, you don't have to turn on your outside lights. That's just the rule for them there. 
So you enjoy the night, Scott. I can't, but that is totally going to be your thing. We're going to lose Abby. You know that. Friday. I know, I know. Like, Abby's off again. Where could he be? <laughs> anyway, what, you know something is, is going to be happening between the 15th and the 29th of this April. This, the skies at night, again, are going to be beautiful because we're going to be seeing meteor showers from like the 15th to the 29th. But the peak of it will be happening on the 22nd. I'm going to say this wrong. I think it's called the Lyrid. The Lyrid. Lyrid meteor yes. shower. I may be saying that incorrectly, but Abby. He's right between the 15th and the 29th. So more to look forward to. Thank you so much for the update. Uh, those of you who posted pictures of the solar eclipse yesterday as well, I uh, appreciate that. Photos from all over the place. All right, we don't have much of an update in the commute. Hey, Corey, it's been No, quiet. really quiet commute overall. But if you do see something, give me a call, 204-788-3093. So we have time for this bit of fun. Before 8 o'clock, we were talking to Dr. Jonas Watson, the veterinarian at Grand Park Animal Hospital, and he was talking about tick season starting early. What do you do with the pets? And we got in kind of a side conversation during the interview about the challenge sometimes of getting medication into your dog or your pet's mouth. And so uh, there is a video. If you're a pet lover, you might have seen this. A tune goes along with it. A surefire way to get something into your dog's mouth is using cheese. And if you don't, in fact, give your dog cheese when you're making your own sandwich that has cheese on it, you might, in fact, owe them the cheese tag. The cheese tax, the cheese tax. You gotta pay the cheese tax every time you're cooking. When the cheese comes out, this puppy comes looking. The rules are the rules, and the facts are the facts. And when the cheese drawer opens, you gotta pay the tax. The cheese tax, the cheese tax. Hand it over quick, or things might get ugly. I can get really loud, I'm a really barky puppy. I'm not just asking, cause I'm looking for snacks. This is real important business, and you gotta pay the tax. The cheese tax. The cheese tax, the cheese tax. Oh, yeah. Sixteen, the time right now, and let's uh, turn to more serious matters here. An iconic Winnipeg restaurant meets an iconic local intersection. As I mentioned uh, at the top of the hour here, 529 opened three businesses at Portage and Main a month ago. So they're upscale restaurant, but then also a cafe uh, and uh, one in the lobby of 201 Portage, but also a burger shop then down in the concourse. Now, the same week that all of these businesses were being launched, the mayor announced plans to open the intersection of pedestrians and potentially close the underground concourse at Portage and Main. The announcement came as a surprise to Doug Stephen, who's president and CEO of Wow Hospitality, which owns 529 and a number of other restaurants in the city. And Doug's on the line now. Good morning. Good morning, Marcy. How are you doing? I'm well. So what went through your mind then when you were you know, doing your openings and then the next day the mayor is talking about reopening Portage and Main? Well, he actually made the uh, announcement the day before we had our opening. So uh, we were aware. So, uh, of course, I took him aside before he made his comments for our opening and, and uh, thanked him, obviously, and then uh, made the, the comment that we would have to have a chat about that because we're certainly in favor of opening the intersection. Uh, as you said, it's an iconic intersection, and it's been very strange for these mass, these last decades when it's been closed. But um, we are not uh, a huge uh, supporter of op uh, closing the concourse downtown uh, underneath because it will isolate the buildings. And uh, there are a number of people that use that underground for uh, getting about downtown, particularly when we've got six to seven months of inclement weather. And uh, we have to uh, try to get from building to building. And uh, that concourse allows people to do that without bundling up. Mm. Um, pardon me for getting the timelines wrong there, Doug. Um, can you describe exactly specifically, you know, what restaurants are, are um, one of them is in the concourse. Is that right? Well, what it is, 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 is in the lobby of 201 York. It's been beautifully uh, redesigned uh, by uh uh, Roseanne Hill Blaisdell from Harvard, and uh, it's very high end. So on the main floor, we have a 60 seat sister concept to 529 called 529 Uptown, and it has uh, some of the classics from 529, as well as some Japanese influences uh, that are pretty incredible. And then on the other side of the escalator, where for those of you that used to go into that building where Starbucks used to be as where we have our 529 coffee. 
and it has um, high-end coffees and drip coffees and pastries and dainties and sandwiches and, and little express items. And then our actual hot kitchen uh, to produce the food is downstairs on the concourse level. And so out that window where our hot kitchen is, is 529 Burger, which is an Oklahoma-style smash burger. And it's uh, become very popular very quick. And a number of people that come over from either the Richardson Building or 360 Main or 300 Main uh, come over uh, using the the underground. So, so it's that not that will... you're it's not that you're just interject here. It's not that your burger joint will close because the concourse is closing. You're not located right in there. There's I think 13 businesses that are right in that circus. But uh, but the traffic underground, you believe, is is uh, it, was that one of the reasons that you opened there? It, absolutely, it was, and it will definitely get impaired. And uh, I was down there uh, last week and the week before, just watching as we were trying to uh, serve our guests. And uh, a number of people that I happen to know uh, from the other buildings, including lawyers and accountants from uh, the other buildings and business people, uh, were sitting down. And I was able to say hello, and I asked them specifically because uh, that news had been out. And they said, Doug, we we probably wouldn't be visiting visiting you if we had to bundle up to uh, cross the intersection in January. You know, some people might argue more foot traffic could help businesses at 201 Portage because I know we did experiments at CBC. We actually did time lapse of if you're you know walking down Portage, you want to go through the whole tunnel system. What does it take to get from all four corners underneath? And it's obviously way easier just to cross the street. So what do you make of that, that actually this won't be as big a deal as, you know, that the, the concerns won't be realized? Um, I, I guess you, your comments may be valid, um, but I, I do believe that if we can encourage people to use the concourse more, I happen to be in Toronto right now, and, and the underground here works incredibly well. Uh, we uh, need to look after ourselves from a business perspective and from a population perspective, because the more people that are out and about and walking, uh, the better it will be for Winnipeg in in general. And in the summertime, absolutely, particularly if they figure out a way to do scramble uh, crossing, um, it could be uh, very good to sort of enhance the vibrancy of downtown Winnipeg. But I still am concerned with what happens once we have to put coats on and, and make that crossing. Uh, it may be a different story. Uh, I know Toronto is a very different city too, right? Uh, so many people, uh, it's more of a foot traffic city and people are on the train and all that kind of thing too. Yep. So it's sort of, we're almost in a position in Winnipeg where we're trying to shift a whole bunch of behaviors. Um, and then also trying to look at the bottom line. Of, of the decisions around the behaviors. So obviously, you know, part of this was all about cost, you know, replacing the mem- membrane um, that would be necessary to be needed to sort of protect the concourse underneath and have it open. What for you would be the ideal outcome for Portage and Maine moving forward then? Well, uh, if I had the wish list, it would be both, Marcy, because I, I love the fact that there's an idea we can open up that intersection above ground. But I think that if we could uh, figure out a way to deal with the uh, remedial costs uh, of, of um, repairing the membrane, I think that trying to a way to get the concourse even more vibrant. And, you know, we still have business owners that have the Winnipeg shops of Winnipeg Square that are attached and everything that's going on underneath the Richardson building that's attached through the concourse. Uh, including banks, and then, of course, uh, what's now going on at 201. And uh, it definitely, uh, if we could figure out a way to make sure that we enhance that traffic corridor uh, in the circus, that uh, we can have the best of both worlds. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for being on the program this morning, Doug. appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Marcy, and have a good day. You as well. That's Doug Stephen Stephen weighing in on his thoughts on Portage in Maine and the plan to uh, reopen it to pedestrian traffic, but also specifically his concerns about closing the uh, the circus underneath the concourse. He is president and CEO of Wow Hospitality, which owns 529, and it's a newer uh, restaurant uh, offshoots, one of them a burger place, which is underground.
Hi, I'm Paul Haverschrud, host of The Cost of Living, a national business show that looks at everything the world of money touches, which, admittedly, is a lot of stuff. The Cost of Living. Go beyond the facts and figures and discover the compelling business stories that affect the day-to-day -day lives of Canadians right across the country. Economics, business, and you. The Cost of Living with host Paul Haverschrud. Available now on CBC Listen. It's partly cloudy. It's 2 degrees. Winds are calm. Our high today is 15. And if you need us on the drive, walk or roll, 788-3093. By the way, uh, we haven't really opened the phone lines uh, since the announcements were made around Portage in Maine. So if you want to um, weigh in, 788-3205. It's just about been a month since we were digesting that news. Uh, man, that has come and gone in our city over so many decades, that conversation. We'll see what happens next. Lots of plans for downtown that are coming. Uh, next in the program, we have a bit of music from an artist out of Montreal. Momello is dedicating her debut single to all the millennials who are nostalgic for the music vibes of the early 2000s. This one is fantasy. <laughs>
is she hitting the upper register with that note? That's crazy. That's Montreal artist Mamello. Her uh, debut album, as we mentioned, is hearkening back to the uh, nostalgic musical vibes of the early 2000s. Is it ever? Uh, I want to point you to my Facebook page because in the coming days, we're going to have some fun with mugs. If there's one thing we all have in common... We're all drinking something in the morning, whether it's coffee or tea or water. You're having something in the morning, and often it's in some kind of a mug. So we're inviting you to show us your mug shot. So we uh, have prompted that already on Facebook. We started to collect photos. And if you have a great story behind your mug, please share that as well. And we'll uh, we'll get this going. So we've got some uh, photos coming in already this morning. Uh, there's people that are coming in with mugs that say things like, I'm not bossy. I just have better ideas than you. <laughs> like that one. I'm going to have to get a mug that says that. But share your mug shot. We'll have uh, some morning fun with it in the days ahead. Right now, though, it's time for your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 8.30, it is 2 degrees in Winnipeg. We're going to see a mostly sunny afternoon as we head to a high of 15. A third person hurt when the Fort Gibraltar footbridge collapsed last year is now suing Festival de Voyageur and the city of Winnipeg. Last May 31st, a group of students was touring the historic site when the wooden footbridge crashed to the ground. 17 children and one adult were hurt. In this latest case, the complainant says she fell six meters and suffered numerous permanent injuries. In court documents, it says she suffered a fractured spine and injuries to the neck and foot. It also says the incident caused her psychological damage. She is seeking general damages for the loss of ability to earn an income and medical expenses. Two other lawsuits on behalf of children who were injured have also been filed. The town of the Paw has lost an iconic historic theater from a fire. The Lido Theater caught fire early yesterday morning. It's expected to be a write-off. The nearly 100-year-old theater underwent renovations in 2020, but has been closed since the pandemic. The town recently acquired the building and was putting $50,000 towards cleaning it up and revitalizing the space. The Paws mayor, Andre Murphy, says it is a heartbreaking loss for the community. It pulls on your heart a little bit. Us that grew up in this in the community, uh, Saturday matinees with uh, 25 cents and uh, got a bag of popcorn and a pop and a chocolate bar and, and then acted out the movie on the way home. Um, so, yeah, no, we uh, it's, it is absolutely devastating. Murphy says the building must be torn down because it now poses a safety risk. The cause of the fire has not been released. The wife of a Winnipeg man who's been in a Mexican hospital for more than a month desperately wants him home. Jim Gibbons has been in hospital in Mazatlan after a scratch on his leg turned into deadly sepsis. His wife, Stacy Conway, says initially their insurance company said he could come home when he was fit to fly. When doctors gave him the all clear, Conway says Sun Life told her the WRHA said there were no beds in Winnipeg. Now Conway says flights arranged by the insurance company for him to come home have been cancelled. She says all the people who travel to Mazatlan to view yesterday's solar eclipse are taking up those flights. There are millions of people there right now, and they're all going to be trying to get home tomorrow and this week. There's no flights for him. In a statement, Sun Life says when it's arranging to send a patient back to Canada, a hospital bed must be available. The WRHA tells CBC a lack of beds was not a barrier in in Gibbons' case. The opposition conservatives say the government isn't being transparent about how many new health care workers it's hired. The NDP won't reveal how many health care workers have been hired since it took power six months ago. The government has announced more hospital beds and facilities in the past few days. But Tory health critic Kathleen Cook worries they're not being staffed by new workers. The fact that the minister wasn't willing to answer that question in question period concerns me that these are not net new positions, that these might be staff coming from other areas of the health care system. Cook says the government also promised to update wait times for patients. She says the latest online data is from January. Ottawa's nationwide cap of international students means even tighter competition just to be considered. The province advocated for more than 18,000 attestation letters after Ottawa proposed about 15,000. The letters confirm Manitoba's approval for students, but they don't guarantee a spot. Renee Cable is Manitoba's Minister of Advanced Education and Training. 
We know that our institutions provide quality education. We know that we have room for them. And frankly, we want international students here and we want them to stay and build a life here in Manitoba. So, you know, while it was disappointing, I think that we can say proudly that we worked hard to ensure that we got our fair share. Cable says the province will continue to work with its post-secondary schools and with the federal government. You can find more news updated throughout your day. Just stay in step with CBC through our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. And thanks for helping me fix my pants. Oh, my goodness. That was so funny. <laughs> I had a seam in my pant leg, like completely just come uh, come apart. So, yeah, it was going to be a very spicy show, but we stapled it shut. Uh, staples, <laughs> they cure everything. With the help of Megan Ketchison, who actually, you know, she's such a talented seamstress. Even with a staple gun, she made this look perfect. And, and uh, right along the seam. You can't even tell. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, man. Some mornings are just like that. Yeah, I for tell a short you. period there, our YouTube uh, view spiked uh, <laughs> by 3,000. It was wild. <laughs> didn't know what was going on. And then we realized. Uh, all right, let's get into the uh, last look at uh, the commute. That is Corey Funk. What's up? Uh, yeah, a bit of a straightforward commute today. Uh, if you're out there, enjoy the weather. If you're biking, rollerblading, skateboarding, hope you have fun out there. Nice. So it's been a, all morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not yeah, a call. That's, Lovely. That's, that's okay. We'll take it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Abby, we're going to uh, have some cloud with us through the day. Yes, yeah, not a bad day at all, but just a mix of sun and clouds. And then sunny later by the afternoon period, we're heading to a higher 15. Mix of sun and cloud for Brandon and Duff. And Churchill will see sun and clouds and then cloud in Churchill. Happy birthday to my father. I usually don't use the airwaves to do these things, but uh, happy birthday, Dad. And uh, to uh, my lifelong friend that's been my buddy since I was five years old, and I met uh, when we went to that Meet the Teacher before kindergarten. She turns 50 today. So welcome to the club. Uh, it was me last month. They share a birthday, those two. So every once in a while, uh, I'll just let those little personal things leak out. So thanks for bearing with me. And thank you for listening, listeners. Uh, appreciate you always. And weigh in any time on anything you hear in the show, 788-3205. And we hope you join us again tomorrow morning for Information Radio. Thanks to the team that put the program together. Our leaders in unit, Nelly Gonzalez, as well as producer Wendy Parker and Leif Larson, are working on the show yesterday. Also in unit, our hardworking team of associate producers and our live crew. Abby Adiemi, Corey Funk, Brad Lillies, Megan catch us in and Heather Wells and Joni Niccolo out in our news department. Take care, be well, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow here on CBC.